Hey guys, I am going to do the usual of uh, waiting for everyone to arrive and uh, then we will go ahead and get started. If someone can just confirm when we have sound, <clears throat> I didn't set up my, um, my backup computer. Hi guys. Okay, if someone could just let me know. Perfect. All right. So <clears throat> I wasn't going to do any more lives, um, but I did feel that the events that have transpired in the past week have warranted it. So um, first, an explanation. My hair is not purple anymore. It was actually never purple. And that was a wig. Uh, and I had already made a public statement after Lori was convicted because there were all these trolls <clears throat> just basically, you know, trying to out me for uh, having cancer and, you know, why was she wearing a wig and things like that. And finally, I was just like, it's not like I'm ashamed <laughs> that I've been um, battling cancer. So I just kind of stripped them of their power and went public. The only reason I didn't go public with it was that I didn't want to distract from the case. I, I don't want to be part of the story as much as possible. The real victims are those who lost their lives. And I don't, I just didn't want to distract from it. And I do tend to be very private aside from all that I've shared in these lives and on analytics, but that has only ever been to share the victim stories. And I felt like I kind of needed <clears throat> to share some of my story uh, to explain my Joe's and my relationship and how much I related to Tylee's story because uh, there were quite a few of uh, similarities in how we grew up. <clears throat> so, um, so my hair is growing back. I went through uh, chemo. I will be officially finished with cancer treatments one month from today. So this started uh, last March and we'll, I'll hopefully cross the finish line for good uh, a month from today. Um, I'm also battling a cold, uh, I, I think because I was stranded in the Denver airport overnight coming back from Idaho. It took me 22 hours to get home. And uh, the airport was really cold and all the shops were, were closed. And by the time I got on the plane at 6 a.m., I was like, you know, coughing. I masked up for everyone else's sake. But <clears throat> anyway, so that's why I have deep, sexy voice. Um, but so I might have to, logistically, I might have to like stop and you know, uh, take care of, of stuff, but that's, that's fine. I just didn't want too much time to pass uh, from the time of Lori's sentencing hearing. So what I'm going to do tonight is just kind of take you chronologically through my experience, because this is largely my thoughts and my reactions. I mean, we're, you know, almost a week out Clearly, you don't come to a murderous heart for late breaking news. That's that's not my objective. Uh, I <clears throat> obviously have a horse in this race um, with uh, this case, and um, and so I just thought I would just talk through, um, you know, but for the most part, go chronologically through the events that transpired and share from my perspective. Okay, so it actually started last Wednesday. There was a hearing to determine if um, Vicki uh, Hoban, I think her last name was, um, <clears throat> would be able to give a victim impact statement on behalf of Summer. And uh, she, the uh, Judge Boyce did grant her that, um, that ability, which, I thought was absolutely fantastic. But we found out in that hearing that Summer and Colby, Summer Shiflet, Lori's sister, Colby Ryan, Lori's son, uh, he 
she gave him my brother's uh, last name, but as it turns out, he was never adopted. Um, <clears throat> so I have no relation to Colby, only to Tylee. But they were both approved to make uh, victim impact statements, but uh, it was announced that uh, Summer was going to make, well, I'm not sure if this was part of the announcement or if I found this out from Rob, but <clears throat> they wouldn't be attending the hearing. I was under the impression that neither of them were going to give a victim impact statement. That was very upsetting. <clears throat> I was in the grocery store when someone told me because I had been, uh, I think on a client call, missed the hearing. And uh, so I called Rob Wood from the grocery store. I <clears throat> was like ordering stuff from the deli counter and you know talking to him. So it was a little chaotic but I just felt such a, a sense of urgency. And he had told me, he was like, I swear to you, I had just told Whitney Gee, the victim's advocate, I need you to come in, we need to call Annie Cushing. So we were very much on the same page. And my question was, is it possible for me at this late hour? Uh, yeah, I definitely thought that Summer just wasn't giving one. Um, it, but at this late hour, would it be possible to make an emergency request that I be designated Tylee's legal representative in Summer's uh, stead? And he had said that Summer had written a victim impact statement, but she just didn't want it shared publicly. So <clears throat> uh, because of that, it won't be part of a, a FOIA document request as well. So that was disconcerting. Um, you know, I, did, I wanted to give her the benefit of the doubt while wrestling through this, you know, these feelings of deep disappointment that like, and, and kind of panic that like no one was going to represent Tylee in the victim, in the um, hearing. And <clears throat> so, but, he, he thought that uh, that Summer could represent Tylee's mother and I could represent Tylee's father, my brother Joe, who is deceased, who I believe was Lori's first victim, but his death isn't being investigated. Um, but uh, so I, I just decided, all right, I'll, I'll shoot my shot. So I... Uh, wrote an email to the the clerk with my request, and I included in there my victim impact statement, really just more for the sake of expediency, because there wasn't a lot of time. You know, at this point, it was pretty close to the end of the day, Wednesday, and so we were bumping up against, you know, any deadlines, because the hearing was on um, on Monday. So <clears throat> heard nothing Thursday, I think Friday, Judge Boyce uh, issued uh, an order that it would not be permitted because uh, the representatives are assigned per victim and, um, and there's only one representative allowed per victim. So it's not in lieu of like an immediate family member. <laughs> So, and I had communicated in my email to Judge Boyce that I was confident that, yeah, you know, if the law didn't allow it, that he would protect Lori's right to a fair trial. And by zealously protecting her right to a fair trial, he is protecting the, the victims. But when I made the request, oddly enough, there, I guess because Idaho Falls is such a small airport, there's only one option for me. Um, and that is to fly into Denver and then Denver to uh, Idaho Falls. At least there was at the late hour that I was checking. But the last time I flew to Idaho Falls, there was also only one option. And one of those planes, I think the, the smaller one, only had two seats left. So I was kind of between a rock and a hard place because I thought, well, if he approves it, 
and I don't get a seat on the plane. It, this is all moot. So I went ahead and uh, booked the flight <clears throat> and um, just decided, you know, regardless, I was I was going to attend. The only reason I wasn't going to attend, and this isn't a, a flex, um, but I had just had surgery a few weeks ago, so I wasn't supposed to lift anything heavier than five pounds uh, for six weeks. So, um, but it was it was fine. Um, but <clears throat> anyway, so um, so that was that that was the first thing. So then I get to Rexburg, and um, and there was a meetup. So, uh, you know, I, I had thought, like I had told Janice, like, I don't think anyone's going to come to the courthouse until like 5 a.m. But like at the earliest, you know, I, I just couldn't imagine that. And like these weren't like T-Swift tickets that you were trying to buy the day of the, the concert, you know. Um, but <clears throat> uh, she had said someone had posted that uh that she was going to be at the courthouse at 5 uh, p.m. And so Janice wanted to be first in line. So we were hanging out by the courthouse. I, f I forget what time I flew in, but I flew in in the afternoon and we were hanging out in front of the, the courthouse with uh, some, some of um, our closest friends. And, uh, but I had said, you know, that I wanted, to, I needed to leave before reporters got there. And it wasn't to be mysterious. Um, it just, you know, one, I know as from having been a reporter, if you're in a public place, then you have no expectation of privacy. So they would be able to record whatever they wanted to record and, um, you know, take whatever pictures they, they wanted to take. And, you know, I, I've had a couple of bad experiences with reporters, like one reporter had asked to interview me. I wasn't interviewing, but this reporter wanted background information on Joe and, you know, and had said it would be really helpful just to have this information about Joe. And I realized over time that it was easy for reporters to manipulate me by just like with this carrot, like this is your opportunity to advocate for uh, Joe. That's how I got sucked into that sucktastic uh, Netflix documentary. Um, they were like, you know, Colby has made these allegations, but we want you to be able to represent uh, Joe's perspective, and not only did it, and I, I think I interviewed with them for, I think it was like seven or eight hours. Not only did they not include any of the advocacy uh, for Joe, they took something out of context and sidled it up with something that Colby said about Joe's abuse and made it sound like I was confirming. <clears throat> so, um, and then this other reporter had asked, okay, well, will you talk off the record? So I said, yes, having been a reporter, I know when someone says they're talking off the record, that is sacrosanct. You do not violate that under any condition. And not only did this reporter quote me, this reporter misquoted me and assigned all of these like kind of cloying, glowing statements that I just wouldn't make. It's just not in my personality to make kind of <clears throat> overarching statements as much as I would love to at times, you know, especially to defend Joe over time, people lose credibility by doing that. And so, you know, so I, you know, overwhelmingly uh, the media has been very respectful. I've had lots of really good experiences, especially with uh, those reporters who have really covered the, the case closely. And I will always be tremendously grateful for even the sketch reporters, just for keeping the story out uh, in, in front of the public. Uh, very early on, <clears throat> one of my kids shared a link with me and it was a, a young girl who had gone missing from Brooklyn. She was um, a, a person of color 
And my, um, uh, yeah, one of my kids asked, hey, could you share this? Because no one is talking about this girl who has gone missing. And and I you know, first verified that this was an actual uh, case. And at first I was skeptical because I couldn't find anything uh, except for a couple of posts on Facebook by family members. And so I actually had to look her up on, you know, the um, the missing kids list. I forgot what the official name for that. But um, and I did verify it and I did share it and it got very little traction. And so I've always kind of kept that you know, in front of me when I've been frustrated with the media, just like, you know, there, there is a certain amount of privilege that so many people have carried my niece in their hearts, these victims in their hearts and, and, um, you know, all of the victims. And I think over time, even Joe, you know, and in the beginning, when I started people, you know, um, especially after, Colby went on Dateline with his allegations, which I'll circle back to. You know, there there were um, pitchforks and and tar and feathers, and I was like, he's he's dead. You know, like you all you're doing is destroying his reputation um, posthumously. But anyway, <clears throat> so um, again, more on that uh, a little bit later. But so all that to say, I um, you know I. I, I I had told them uh, I'll I'll stay out until reporters start showing up. A couple of reporters did come over and and talk to us, uh, but they didn't recognize me because you know the first time I went out to Idaho I had long red hair. The second time I had a purple wig, and this time I was wearing a baseball hat, sunglasses, and short red hair. <laughs> and so. They, they just didn't recognize me and I didn't talk since I have kind of a distinctive um, 12 year old's voice, except when I have a cold. That's the only thing I enjoy about having a cold. I'm like, I don't sound 12. But, um, but so aside from the, the, the media thing, um, I, <clears throat> I did hang out with some friends. Uh, some of the media came back early. I, we had just gone to get drinks and, and chargers and um, I was heading back to in front of the courthouse and someone said, uh, I think it was Nate Eaton, um, Nate Eaton's here. And so I thought, well, I'm not going to be able to <laughs> disguise myself well enough uh, with Nate or Justin especially. And so I said, okay, time, time for me to bounce. But <clears throat> also, um, you know, uh, I so love that we have this community that has been built around the case. I so appreciate my moderators and admins, my moderators here and admins and, and moderators on um, uh, Cool Cats, uh, the Facebook group, which you can't find because I said it to Hidden because we were just so tired of sock puppets uh, trying to get in. Um, but but so it's it's been wonderful to like actually build um, a really nice community and as much as i would love to hang out with them when i roll into rexburg um you know i'm so in my head uh, it's it's just you know it's not like a dramatic thing it's it's just you know being there it's like that's where you know tylee and jj were at last and they were you know strangers to it and so it's it's you know and uh yeah i i get pretty pretty melancholic um and so in my head and normally i'm an extrovert i'm a shy extrovert so it's a it's a really weird flex but um but i'm an extrovert so i or then actually just barely more extroverted than introverted but extroverted I am. And so I love being around people. That's why I love New York City. I get a lot of energy from, you know, just seeing people in the community um, get to hang out and stuff. But this, uh, this sense of like melancholy is, is powerful enough that 
you know, my concern, uh, you know, aside from the media, is that I wouldn't want to come across as like rude or standoffish and, um, and you know, end up like spoiling the fun. So <clears throat> that's why, you know, if you looked at pictures from the meetup, I wasn't, I wasn't in them. So <clears throat> I just went back to um, the house that um, Janice had so graciously gotten us, which was right around the corner from <clears throat> the courthouse, really <laughs> miraculously. Uh, the the person who owns the Airbnb is usually booked, I think Janice said a year out, but she had just had a last minute cancellation. So we were able to just walk over uh, to the courthouse, which was really nice. So I just went back to the house and you know, just kind of powered down and so um moving on to the next thing <clears throat> someone had sent me a screenshot of a post that cole vallow had made and cole had reshared a post that his mom uh, cheryl had made <clears throat> uh that alleged uh, that uh Kay and Larry had um, stolen $500,000 from Cole and Zach. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so I was really of two minds in what to do. Actually, I, I mean, I just went back and forth over, you know, I don't have a horse in this race. Uh, but the thing that tugged at my heart personally was, you know, I know Cole, I know Zach, I met them in 2007. They were on the 2007 vacation in Florida. They were really, really wonderful kids, and they got along really well with my kids. And there weren't any issues. They were just really sweet guys. Uh, Cole was a teen, and, and Zach was was younger, I forget how old he was, like maybe nine, 10, something like that, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, and they really have uh, taken a back seat, mostly by their choice. They've just stayed away from the media. Um, one of them did interviews early on under a pseudonym, you know, because I think there were fears of was, was there anyone else out there who could possibly retaliate? Mm. So we we found out a few things from them. I found out more details from them in the, the FOIA docs, but I always just kind of like zeroed in on anything about Cole and, and Zach because they have a story in this too. And <clears throat> again, this isn't a flex. This is just where my mind was. I had you know, lots of time to just kind of process this. And, um, and so I, I think if, if it had just been Cheryl that um, shared it, and, and absolutely no offense to Cheryl, we reconnected with uh, Cheryl, her husband, uh, as well as Cole and Zach at the trial and Cole and Zach, and Sh I had never met Cheryl before, but Cole and Zach you know, were just as wonderful as uh, when we had vacationed with them. And uh, and my daughter uh, was there at the time. And so she was reconnecting with them. And it was just a, a really nice time. And we also just kind of like exchanged notes and you know, they, they opened up about things that <clears throat> I wouldn't have otherwise known. I wouldn't, I wouldn't share, um, but, um, and so, you know, I, I think, if it had just been Cheryl's post, I, I probably, and I really, really like Cheryl, but I probably would have stayed away from it. But I think the thing that really tugged at me was uh, uh, um, Cole sharing it, sorry. Um, so <clears throat> I shared it on um, uh, Cool Cats vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the, the video of um, Kay sharing under, you know, saying under oath that Charles did ask her to give 500000 uh, so half of the insurance money to Cole and Zach. 
the other half was for her to, you know, and uh, Larry to raise and JJ, <clears throat> excuse me. I did first ask Cheryl if she could clarify, was she talking about uh, the, that she thought that they were entitled to all of it or was she talking about the 500,000 that Charles had said he wanted uh, to go to Cole and Zach. And so she created a new post. And as far as I know, Cole didn't reshare that one. And that's because that one was clearer. I, you know, I, I was a little torn because I really wanted to share the, the screenshot that showed Cole, uh, that this was Cole's post. Uh, but the the one, the second one that she shared was much clearer. She had also clarified in a comment uh, to someone. And at some point, Kay's sister joined into the fray and backed Cheryl up. So that that is that's where things are. Um, you know, I I again I don't have a horse in this race. Uh, a sock puppet told me to get an attorney, and so it was just like I I say a sock puppet because you know anytime someone says something that's kind of weird, I poke through their Facebook account. And at this point, and then, you know, I'm not batting a thousand, but at this point, there are so many common denominators with uh, sock puppet accounts. And one of them, uh, which is a telltale sign that this is, these are offshore accounts, is they will frequently answer someone um, by uh, stating their relation to them. You know, so they're like, oh, you know, Thank you, niece. That's so nice, you know. And, and it's just not something that like Americans say. We don't, we don't identify. Like maybe you know, son, but um, you know, the, even daughter. Like I, you don't typically hear someone say, you know, it's great to see you, daughter. You know, and so and definitely not with niece, nephew, things like that. So there was that, and then um, some of the. Um, the pictures and, and stuff. So I was just like, I was pretty sure this was a sock puppet and, um, you know, telling me to get a lawyer. So I'm like, well, that doesn't really make sense because, you know, if, if you're Joe Sixpack or whatever their name was, you don't have a horse in this race. So, and, and, you know, certainly sharing uh, a post isn't defamation. That said, um, one of the things that, you know, edged me closer to um, sharing it where I ultimately uh, ended uh, or, you know, ended the back and forth was that I know that Cheryl is pretty legally savvy. And so I, I can't imagine that she would open herself to a pretty open and shut uh, defamation case uh, by saying something like this, even being big. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, uh, you know, and certainly wouldn't subject Cole to a defamation case. So it's not defamation um, if it's true. But, <clears throat> okay. The other, the other thing that just kind of bugged me is that uh, we know that Cole and Zach had already lost out on their dad's belongings. Uh, we know from the FOIA docs, that uh, Colby and Lori went to Houston uh, and um, kind of cleaned out Charles' house of valuables. And this is by Colby's admission, talking to a detective from Gilbert Police. Included were an iMac, computers, Charles' truck. Uh, and, um, and so what they had done was they loaded up Charles' truck parked it at the Houston airport. Then <clears throat> Lori gave Alex the key. Alex flew out, or yeah, uh, or I think she might've left the key in the truck. And Alex flew out and uh, drove Charles' truck with all of these belongings um, back to uh, Chandler. So, and at that time, Cole and Zach, as well as Cheryl, were in 
uh, Phoenix meeting or Chandler at the Phoenix area meeting with Detective Moffat. Um, and so, so I just, and, and one thing that, you know, whichever one uh, was interviewed by the media under the pseudonym, he had said that his dad had a really nice watch collection that I can definitely confirm. Charles did have very, very nice watches. Uh, and I think I remember Rolex, but I'm not exactly sure, but <clears throat> they were very nice. They weren't just even like Apple watches. Like that's as, that's as nice as I get with a watch. Um, but anyway, so he had asked Lori for his dad's watch collection. And, um, and he said that he only got back like a, a box of Timex watches. So we know that there was a watch collection and it's probably fairly safe to assume that was also uh, pilfered when they went through the house. So I just kind of feel like, you know, I, I, I hope that they all get this um, worked out. I just know for myself, if I were accused of something like this, you know, I would, I would make a statement, I would drop a screenshot, you know, certainly. I mean, I, but someone told me that Annie wasn't, or said in a Facebook group that Annie wasn't my real name. And so I took a picture of my driver's license, redacted it, went and dropped it in the, um, the Facebook group. So, you know, I'm a little bit more that way. Like if you're going to accuse me of something, I'm going to find some kind of, you know, if, if the evidence exists, I'm going to find it and put it out there. So obviously we all handle things differently and, you know, these different parties uh, may be getting legal counsel. This may already be making its way into the court system, but, um, but that's it. Okay. Uh, so moving ahead to the actual hearing. So I get to the hearing and I uh, go up to the victim's area <clears throat> and, um, and they, they were, you know, just kind of filing us in. And, um, and so I, uh, there's this tap on my shoulder and I turned around and, you know, there, there was no problem noticing it was Rex Connor. And so he introduced himself and he introduced his very lovely wife, Lisa. And so he started off and they were very, very gracious. Um, and he started off by saying, and it, like with the softest of tones, like there was nothing combative. It wasn't a confrontation. In fact, I'm sharing this because I walked away just really I don't know, just thinking like this is the way to disagree. You know? And um, so having said that, um, he had said to me something to the effect of, I know you're not happy about our podcast or you don't support our podcast, something like that, but I want you to know I support you. And so <clears throat> I let him know. And I, I could say this, uh, you know, very genuinely. I said, I don't feel one way or another about podcasts. And I'm a little one against the wind uh, when it comes to even like people profiting off the case. It does, the only time it kind of bothers me is when it's someone who could have helped the victims and then they're presenting a different story and profiting off of that, that, that rubs at me. Um, but for the most part, like, I, I just don't care. Like I, if, if anyone has gotten to know me, I am focused to a fault. I am a one trick pony. When I get focused on something, everything else, pretty much just like goes to black. You know, it just, it doesn't matter. Even if it's like a blip on my radar, I rebound pretty quickly. So my main focus is the victim stories and telling, <clears throat> telling their stories accurately. So I just let him know, you know, I, I don't wish you any harm, you know, with, 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 
doing the podcast or, or the book. But if there is something that is inaccurate, that just runs afoul of what I know the victim story is to be from what we have of the FOIA docs, what we have of you know some of these interviews that these you know different um, people have given. So sometimes you know they would give interviews early on, not having a, or at least it appearing that they had no awareness that one day these FOIA docs would be released and we would have you know a kind of these these checks and balances where we could compare what was said in an interview and you know to <clears throat> what was said uh, to an investigator for example uh, and so so i just let him know if if that happens you know and like i had already said <clears throat> i'm not following their podcast um it's not uh, it, it it's it's mm, it's not a vote of no confidence. I don't follow any of the podcasts. If something is released that is new, particularly interesting, I'll jump in. I didn't even follow, uh, for the most part, the trial after I left because I was, <clears throat> excuse me, so unsettled and, um, and really kind of lost my footing. And then there's just the practical issue of, you know, um, you know, uh, balancing work, treatments, and school. And so I just didn't have five hours a day to uh, listen to testimony. And I also know my gravitational pull is going to be to hear something and say, "Wait, hold up, that that's not that's not right," you know, and check my timeline or check, you know, the FOIA docs and, and stuff. So I just didn't have that that time to invest in it. So, <clears throat> but I let him know that at some point I will listen um, to the, the podcast. And if there's anything that I don't agree with or that, you know, runs afoul of these facts, I will address those things, but it's not a, a personal thing. And and he was very much like, fair enough. You know, I, I respect that. And um, and then he had said something about um, Adam. And I was like, oh, man, we were doing so well, <laughs> you know, like and 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 I just said, you know, basically, I I, I have a different perspective on that because of you know, this 2007 vacation where I knew that his and his then wife, uh, Nicole, and their son, Zach, uh, their expenses were also paid. And then Joe was attacked the following week by, by Alex. And then there's this, you know, sticky issue of, you know, both Adam and Colby knew the details that he was supposed to, that he was going to be um, stuffed in a trunk. Uh, Colby caught himself in his Netflix documentary. So he, he said something about the, the trunk and then he said, oh, but who knows? And, um, but Adam uh, went into the whole thing, you know, how he's going to be um, shot and, <clears throat> and buried in the desert, you know, some, something to that effect. And, uh, and so, you know, it's not in Lori's nature to brag about her failures, you know, to brag about Alex's failures. So for me, I just felt like, you know, especially with Colby's statement in his Netflix documentary that the whole family knew that Lori wanted Joe dead. And I was just like, how do these shocking statements just like, you know, just like kind of go largely unnoticed, uh, like not even talked about. And I think it's partly because there's so many like really, really bizarre aspects to this case. It's easy to, to lose sight of those. But getting back to Rex and Lisa, I, again, there was, you know, I, I was being respectful of, of, of them. Um, they were being respectful of me. We just agreed to disagree. 
and it was so pleasant. Like no one was, I didn't feel like anyone was gaslighting. I certainly wasn't uh, gaslighting them, but I also didn't feel like they were gaslighting me. And I will actually uh, circle back to another detail about Lisa as I make my way through, um, through these details. Okay, so moving on to we, we all started to sit down and on the bench I was on, Tammy's family was to my right, the Vallow and Woodcock family were to my left, and I was, I was in the middle, looking solo. And so we started to kind of like, you know, um, squash in because it was, it was pretty tight. And I hear my name, I hear someone call out my name. And so I look over and I recognize uh, um, Tammy's aunt, Vicki, I think it's Coven. I, Really should have double checked that, but anyway, but she waved and she was like, "Hi, Annie," and and so I was like, "Oh, hi, Vicky," you know, and and I just told her, "Like, I'm so glad you're going to be able to give a victim impact statement," and you know, it was just like a, a really sweet and um, very genuine exchange. So you know, I could feel my anxiety level just kind of like you know, coming down. And it was like, I had this really nice uh, exchange and conversation with Rex and Lisa and then uh, Vicky. And then the woman who was sitting directly next to me, um, her name is Julie. And Julie is Vicky's daughter. So Tammy's cousin um, by extension. And <clears throat> she, we just started talking. And she was also very lovely, very nice. Um, but she said something that, you know, I, I, there are times I think like nothing else can surprise me in this case. And, um, and I was proved wrong. And uh, there would be one other um, really big surprise. Uh, and I'm, I'm not trying to like keep you hanging out. It's just, uh, this was a pleasant surprise. That was an unpleasant surprise. But she told me that, her daughter was really good friends with Tylee. So when Lori and Charles, uh, along with Tylee and JJ, moved back from Hawaii, they moved to Chandler and they moved into Julie's family's ward. So Tylee was part of uh, the girls group. I forget what it's called in the LDS uh, faith, but so Tylee and her daughter as well as these other girls were good friends. And I just, I, I, I was stunned. <laughs> I was just like, how is this even possible? But that means that Vicki, who was just granted permission to share her victim impact statement, um, would be representing Tylee, that she, I mean, Julie let me know that she would be um, uh, touching on uh, Tylee and because she had heard of Tylee and, and, you know, Julie was able to share with her about Tylee from the experience her daughter had. And so then I was just like, you know, I, I for, with my particular worldview, uh, it doesn't matter what that is, but, you know, I, I just, I, I just thought it was absolutely, absolutely amazing. And, you know, and so here I was, you know, struggling. I still was struggling with grief, disappointment over Tylee not being represented by someone close to her. It was tremendously reassuring <clears throat> to know that Vicky would um, be representing her. So moving on, um, fast forwarding, I'm not going to be able to share everything. Um, I, you know, o overall, the victim impact statements were very impactful. Everyone shared about their loved ones. And I really felt like Judge Boyce um, was given a really good introduction to who these victims were. Obviously, you know, it would have been my desire to have Tylee represented a little bit more, but we did find out at the hearing that Colby had uh, written a victim impact statement, um, which I was very grateful for. He did uh, advocate for justice 
and you know and um, shared how these crimes have impacted him and there are very few people who have been impacted as much as Colby and so you know that has always made it challenging to uh, share like some of the lives that I've done recognizing you know he was also uh, very much a victim and he did lose his whole family <clears throat> so I was grateful that he shared a victim impact statement was light on details about Tylee but you know at least at least he shared that uh, but the one I want to um, focus on uh, was well no I've already uh, I've already shared that so yeah I I just really appreciated that uh, Vicky was able to share about Tylee and the you know the the bit that she shared it very much resonated uh, with me so Okay, fast forwarding to uh, Rob's closing argument. Mm. I loved, I just absolutely loved his closing argument. It was, it was, you know, from a, I, I used to be an editor before I was uh, uh, an analyst. So I went from being a reporter to, I moved over to editorial and, um, and then, <clears throat> I started doing analytics work uh, for a publishing company and then eventually transitioned to uh, analytics. But um, so the recovering editor in me was just like, and I'm not a flatterer, you know, but uh, it was just so tightly organized. But then also, I just felt like he really summed up who each of these victims were. And um, and then, uh, of course, then uh, transitioned into his argument for why Lori should be given life in prison with no chance of parole. That was really encouraging to me, <clears throat> just because I, you know, if you've followed this case and you followed some of the hoopla around the case, when the death penalty was taken off the table. There was someone out there who kind of, I don't know, frothed up this hysteria and about how because Judge Boyce took the, the death penalty off the table, and I've already made my statement on that and where I landed on that, I don't think a jury would have ever actually sentenced her to the death penalty. Uh, <clears throat> but this person had said that, or th these people were coming to a murderous heart in this like, raw panic that she would be eligible for parole in 10 years because the death penalty was taken off the table. And that legally, Judge Boyce wouldn't be able to sentence her to life in prison with without the possibility of parole because the death penalty was no longer on the table. I just thought that just sounded like absolute nonsense. And I just shared that, you know, that wasn't my interpretation of the statute. You, and I always qualify. I have no legal training. I have, you know, I, I have, you know, no, yeah, I mean, just no legal training. I can just leave it with that. But I do have some common sense, you know. And so I, and I, I also just felt like the the source of this panic, um, you know, kind of had some issues with Judge Boyce. So I was questioning that, and you know, I'm not trying to malign <clears throat> that person. That person does have legal training, you know. So you know, I understand that people were saying, you know, you you're not a lawyer, you know, and I I'm like I've always I, I've always said that, but so I was encouraged just to hear, <clears throat> excuse me, Rob say uh, that she should be given life in prison with no chance of parole, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but, uh, but yeah, so I was happy about that. Um, and and that was very much the highlight. 
but then and i'll just interject with this i was recently talking to someone about you know that i didn't think i would <clears throat> i think i was talking with my daughter that i didn't think i would be able to go back to doing lives because i can no longer remain dispassionate like it's just it's too it's too cutting it's it's too real and whoever it was like i said i think it was destiny said why do you put this pressure on yourself to be dispassionate like everyone knows you're tylee's aunt you know like she, she said i i think you're you're putting this false pressure on yourself that no one else expects of you. Like no one's going to say she loses credibility because she's not dispassionate, you know? And so, so I've been thinking a lot about that. And, and that was part of what led me to do this, this live because <clears throat> some of these details, as much as I will try to hold it together, um, you know, and I really, I, I do feel stress around never wanting to use emotions to like manipulatively add more weight to what I'm saying, things like that. So this is the internal prosecutor uh, that, uh, you know, um, kind of goes, goes round and round in my head. That said, um, the, this next point, I probably will not be able to be dispassionate, but there was, um, there was something Rob had said and I, I pulled the quote. He said, we know she, and he was talking about Tylee, had puncture wounds in her pelvis. And we know from the testimony of Dr. Christensen at trial that those puncture wounds were received at or around the time of death. And let me just say, in my mind, now when I hear at or around the time of death, having read all of these documents, whether it's right or wrong, I just think, it was at the time of death, but there's some, you know, they're, <clears throat> they're not a hundred percent and they don't want the defense to object. So that's how I processed it at the time. So we know from the testimony of Dr. Christensen at trial that those puncture wounds were received at or around the time of death and they were consistent with stabbing, but not consistent with dismemberment. She was the forensic anthropologist with the FBI from Quantico. So they had sent Tylee's remains. Uh, I met with Rob and Rachel and to see the, the crime scene photos and the autopsy photos. And it was a collection of bones, bone fragments and um, charred flesh. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, um, this is what Dr. Christensen was was working with, and they bring in a forensic anthropologist when it's real when the remains are in such a, a state of let's just say disrepair that an Emmy doesn't feel comfortable ruling on the cause of death. So, but at the time, um, you know, I didn't know what he was was referencing because. I had stopped following the case by that point, but um, I was sitting there, you know, in my <clears throat> in this like pew type thing, and, and the grief was like overwhelming. And I was just like, "Am I? Did I mishear him? Did I misunderstand him? Like, surely we're not at sentencing." You know, with this new information being presented, but no one has talked to my knowledge about, you know, Tylee's cause of, of death, you know, and, but, uh, but, and as, you know, and it, what was going through my mind at the time was, you know, with all of the ways I, you know, imagined that Tylee might have died ever since I heard about the neighbor who said that Lori apologized for loud music one night and said that she and Alex were doing karaoke, which they did do karaoke. They were all on Smule. <clears throat> but I always wondered if that was the night of 
and Tylee's murder, also given the state of her remains, I wondered if it was uh, a violent death. And also given the fact that they duct tape uh, JJ's arms, which I did see. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and, uh, you know, apparently suffocated him. I had kind of eventually landed on suffocation. Uh, and I think that I, I suspect that Tylee had put up a fight and that's why they duct taped JJ's arms so much and, and his, his legs, his ankles, uh, and really just went overboard. Everything, everything was overboard. Um, but so, but in all of like my wonders, I never imagined something as violent as that. You know, and I've watched enough true crime. I used to watch a lot of true crime until I became part of true crime. But you know, at that it's considered one of the most personal, like, like hateful types of. Uh, Murder, all murder is horrible. You know, like I'm not saying, you know, like if you're murdered this other way, well, at least you didn't experience this. I'm not in any way, you know, dismissing any kind of murder. Murder's, murder's horrible. But I just never pictured anything as just frantic and violent as a stabbing. And, um, and so I was sitting there just trying to absorb this and very much like, wanting to maintain decorum and not draw attention to myself, not be demonstrative, um, you know, and, um, but like, I was fighting so hard. <clears throat> like I really just wanted to get up and leave, but I knew that wasn't, it just wasn't possible. So I had to just like try to hold it together while this grief and shock just kind of overcame me. And, um, and so my, my shoulders were kind of, I could tell I was like, cause I was very self aware and, you know, not wanting to become part of the story. And, um, and, and then I feel this hand on my back and this, this person, I knew it was Lisa. She was sitting right behind me. I could tell it was, it was a woman's hand and she also handed me a tissue. I could tell then obviously it was a woman's hand. I didn't want to turn around because again, the previous point, didn't want to draw attention to myself, but, uh, but it was just like this moment of humanity, you know, where I'm sure we're not on the same page with a lot of things, but you know, she saw like just a fellow human who she had just met just minutes before you know, struggling under the, the gravitas of, uh, of this, um, this detail. And, um, and so I, you know, if, if she's listening to this, I, I never, I never saw her again and I didn't have a chance to thank her. And so if she's listening or if you know her, you know, um, I would just like to extend a thank you. It was just, it was so kind. And at that point, we were so kind of um, crushed. I knew that there had been packs of tissue on the um, on the seat, but I didn't know where they were, and I didn't want to like you know ask someone to move to see if um, you know if it was behind them or, or whatever. Anyway, so that that was just really touching, and it did help me just kind of like decompress. Then we had the break. I just really wanted to bolt, <laughs> so I went, you know, directly to the door. But they had to keep us in, um, obviously, to protect uh, Lori's safety. <clears throat> so I'm standing at the door, but I'm like, uh, you know, now I just kind of look bitchy because you know, like I just wasn't, you know, I wasn't. Um, <clears throat> I was just struggling. I was, you know, pretty pretty intense. And um, so uh, no one was moving out of their seat. So I went back to where my friends were and they um, helped kind of talk me off the ledge. Uh, and they had um, 
you know, listened to that testimony. And so they, you know, so we, we talked about it and there was, I guess you could call it reasonable doubt and that maybe this was referencing um, the, um, the dismemberment attempts. So, you know, I'm just kind of taking you through the ebb and flow. I will circle back at, at the end with the um, conclusion to that, having dug into it um, more, um, <clears throat> just because that's where it falls in the timeline. Next up, uh, Lori opted to allocute. In other words, you know, um, well, it wasn't next up. John Thomas shared his defense. I'm not going to speak to that. You know, I just feel like they didn't have much to work with. I, I don't know, given the fact that uh, I, I don't know that Judge Boyce is like a religious man. And, you know, even if he is going the what would Jesus do route, especially given some of the 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 story and how, you know, right up through Lori's allocution, she justified everything she did and, you know, in the most bizarre way possible. So they just didn't have much to, to work with. Um, <clears throat> so and that's as, as much as I'm going to say about that because, yeah, I, no one would have envied him at that point. And uh, Jim Archibald was very wise <laughs> to pass. Um, just one second. Okay, uh, moving ahead to Lori's allocution. Oh my gosh. So I was maybe in the minority. Uh, in the courtroom when she said she wanted to speak for herself, I was thrilled. Because in my mind, better to be thought a fool than open your mouth and remove all doubt. I knew that this decision was probably strongly, uh, that she was probably strongly urged not to do this by, uh, by her attorneys. But I, I was happy uh, because I I just thought you know what I I just kind of felt like I was sitting in the courtroom just handing her more rope you know not me personally but I was just like here do you need more rope oh nope you're still going okay um, there were so many issues with this allocution the first one I'm going to hit on is her uh, her NDE. The story, first of all, I mean, who could, you know, like, again, just when I think, I, I can't be surprised. Like, her soul tumbled out of her body, and I think it, like, hit the floor. Like, who has such a clumsy soul? And then someone at the, the hearing had shared that uh, Chad actually said that his soul had... I know, I think it might have been um, uh, someone else. Um, might have been Vicky. But anyway, um, that his soul had, like, it stayed in his body because it, like, got caught in, like, around his ears or something like that. I mean, just just bizarre. So, I mean, if nothing else, they, they were perfectly suited for each other. But um, speaking seriously, I met Lori when she was pregnant with Tylee. I, my family vacationed with her when Tylee was a baby. Uh, she was around 11 months old. <clears throat> and Lori never mentioned this near-death experience. And it's not like Lori is a private person. You know, she was very much into talking about her religious experiences, even though I... My, I'm not LDS. Uh, <clears throat> you know, she's just very, very open about her faith and, and and her different experiences. I've shared before about how even when she went on uh, Wheel of Fortune, 
<clears throat> you know, it wasn't that she just came up with this idea and thought, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm enthusiastic. I might have a pretty good, you know, chance at this audition. No, in her retelling, God told her that she was going to win, uh, that she was going to be on Wheel of Fortune and she was going to win. And, you know, so she would, would she just had a very strong pull toward talking about her religious experiences. So for her to have this experience where, you know, she meets uh, Stacy and Lolly. Um, Lolly was the nickname for um, her sister who died as an infant. Her name was Laura. And, um, and then, you know, she went up to Jesus and, you know, all of, all of these things. And, you know, he told her that she had more <clears throat> to do, um, which I'm just not even going to go down that, down that path. I mean, it's just, it's, it's so bizarre. Like if she had gone to be with Jesus and he knows the, the future from the past, I think he probably would have been like, yeah, you should probably stay here. <laughs> like your future isn't super amazing. But um, anyway, so the NDE, I just think was a clownish attempt at trying to, you know, uh, share the spiritual flex. Uh, and it's very much a, a Cox family shtick to think that they have more influence than they do. And I'll circle back around on that when I talk about Summer's um, <clears throat> uh, interview with Nate Eaton and her uh, statement. But so, I, you know, I just, I, one thing I've thought about is, and I thought about it more when she was sharing the details about, you know, how sick Tylee was and how, you know, she was in the hospital so many times. And I, I want to be fair, but at the same time, there is, um, there is a report in one of the FOIA docs. I think it was a FOIA doc, not a document that someone had shared with me, <clears throat> who had been uh, involved with the investigation investigation around Colby's claims. But uh, Joe had complained that when he got Tylee on Fridays, she was so sleepy they couldn't do anything. So he would just have to, you know, bring her home, and she would sleep. And he felt like his visitation really didn't start until Saturday. And so he alleged that he felt like Lori was giving Tylee something purposely uh, to make her to make her sleep. And in my opinion, having no training whatsoever, I I do I, I do wonder if Lori had um, Munchausen's by proxy. You know, she is so needing of attention. Uh, she kind of fits the the profile in my very unprofessional view in needing to be a, a hero, needing to be sympathized with, um, you know. And so <clears throat> I do I do question if uh, some of I I don't know if they ever did you know any kind of blood panel. Um, I know that one of the MEs had said. In the, the FOIA doc, it was an exchange that uh, I think it was a detective had about an, an, an ME, or it might have been the ME himself, I'm not sure. But he said that they can't just check for the presence of poison. They have to know the poison that they should be checking for. So, um, you know, I can't back that up, but I do wonder if if no one was suspicious of her, if they would have checked to see if, you know, Tylee had anything in her, in her blood system, you know, it could be that she had chronic pancreatitis. I do know from um, <clears throat> having vacationed with them and then having uh, stayed there in 2018, the house was just full of junk and the kids um, ate a lot of junk to be fair. You know, they were generally on vacation except for the 2018 trip. And then I remember going into her walk-in closet and it was just like Costco, you know, but it was like all the fun foods, you know, that, like, you know, all the chips and um, like sugary cereals and, and stuff like that. And so, 
uh, it was hard for me to find like, you know, something nutritious to eat there. And Lori didn't really cook but by her own admission. So anyway, so, you know, like that, that will obviously also contribute, but I do wonder if Lori had Munchausen by proxy, but you know, it was, it was very bizarre that she would, you know, say like she was the only one uh, with, with Tylee, that's a weird flex considering the fact that she had just been found guilty by a jury of her peers for murdering um, Tylee. But um, anyway, oh, also circling back to, oh no, no, I haven't touched on this yet. <clears throat> I'll get to it. Um, she, uh, I also thought it was very strange that she said that she was a young mother and you'd think like, she wouldn't want to leave her children. <laughs> and I'm like, would he? Would Judge Boyce really think that? Like she said it like, but surprisingly enough, yes, I was totally willing to leave my children behind. So yeah, I just thought it was a, a weird, a weird detail. It's you know, it, I think it speaks to just her lack of self-awareness, but also her complete lack of ability to read the room or anticipate how this bizarre defense would be received uh, by Judge Boyce. And um, and as she was allocuting, there were times, you know, I was I was just sitting there, I could see her and I could see Judge Boyce. And it was like, a, almost like watching a tennis match, you know, just kind of studying his defense. And for the, the, the most part, you know, he's he has really developed a stellar poker face. Uh, but there were times where you could see he was just like, what the actual, I'll leave that. Uh, but I know you would see him write things down and, <clears throat> and stuff. Um, I'll talk more about Judge Boyce in a minute. But um, her allegation of uh, sexual abuse by Joe, it, I can't say it was surprising given that you know, she it is still just so convinced that somehow she's going to be able to flex in a way that will convince a judge who is deciding her sentence that she is this very spiritual person, that th these victims, they died of uh, suicide, uh, reaction to medication, uh, I forget what the what the other one was. There was another one. I mean, just absolutely bizarre, you know, that she's just like, I'm just going to go ahead and present my own defense that no, none of these people were killed and no one did as much for my children uh, as I did and, you know, <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things that I thought was interesting was that, she said that Joe had started abusing Tylee when she was three and continued for 10 years. So issue number one, really like that's, that would be all the way through the investigation into uh, sexual abuse. And, you know, um, and, and to the time she's, she's 13, knowing that, there are all these eyes on him. I'm not saying it's completely impossible, but it is highly unlikely. Knowing that he, he would get so little time with her and eventually she chose that you know, she didn't want to do visitation with him. But I think that was also, you know, that Lori played a part in that because he was actually granted custody. And then he, uh, Charles and JJ, from my understanding, from what people have told me, they moved to Hawaii, and I think Anne Eliason, when she was sharing, uh, when she was being interviewed by Detective Yinklin, or however you pronounce her name, she also said that uh, Tylee wasn't with them when they moved out. So I just wonder how much that entire move to Hawaii was a manipulative ploy to separate Tylee from, you know, her very young uh, little brother and her family and to make her want to move um, to Hawaii. So it's like she didn't 
you know, eventually Joe won custody of her through the proper channels and then Lori just abandoned her. Um, but <clears throat> so, you know, so through all of all of this time, supposedly he was still you know, sexually abusing her, according to her testimony. That's 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 asking a judge to believe a lot, you know, from someone who is a pathological liar. The other issue is that, and I've shared this before, I've shared it in um, uh, at least one different live. I've talked about it in different Facebook groups, including uh, Cool Cats and Criminals. But when I was there in 2018, one of the things that really, really disturbed me and made me not ever want to have contact with her again <clears throat> was she had said that when Tylee was a quote, and this is an exact quote because I went through it so many times in my mind, when Tylee was a teeny tiny baby and the rest I can't quote, I will never quote because it was so, this allegation was so disgusting and, and hellacious just in like the detail that she subjected me to. And, and I, you know, I stopped her, but then Tylee was in the room. Like she wasn't, I've talked about this before, before. It wasn't like we were standing in this like dining room area right outside the kitchen. Tylee was standing off to the side in front of this hallway. And that's what she would tend to do. She would, she would hover. And <clears throat> so Tylee was in earshot. So I'm, I'm just like, okay, first of all, Tylee's right here. So this is absolutely disgusting that you would even, you know, that someone would say this out loud. But secondly, it was, it was shocking just because it was like, how is she so unintelligent that she can't figure out how would she know this? You know, if, if Tylee was, quote, a teeny tiny baby, how would she have known this horrible thing that Joe supposedly did to Tylee with the level of detail that, that she told me? You know, she would have either had to have witnessed it, Joe would have had to have told her about it, or someone else would have had to witness it, meaning that Joe would have done this horrific thing to an infant um, and uh, in, in front of someone else. You know, so it it was just absolutely beyond um, bizarre. And so, so for her to say now she was three, I was just like, well, what about the teeny tiny baby story? You know, and I mean, you people can believe what they want. I am a very honest person, I'm not perfect, but uh, but I do have an internal prosecutor. Um, I thank my years of abuse by my foster mother for that and her interrogations. So it's not always a positive thing, uh, but I just would never make up something like that um, it, because it's just so, it's, it's so horrific. Um, but <clears throat> anyway, okay. So there were, there, there was that issue and there were so many issues. Um, when she said that JJ was an adult spirit, I mean, that was, that was a hat tip to her bizarre testimony that she shared at Melanie Gibbs house, uh, that, you know, our children are adults in heaven. And I don't know how that helps her to feel justified, but, you know, supposedly Tylee told her to stop worrying. JJ told her she didn't do anything wrong. And her good friend, Tammy, you know, told her she was happy and she was, you know, um, or no, this was later on. These were you know, her near death experiences opened her up to having communication with people who have gone to heaven. And then that's when she said that, you know, Tylee comforted her and, and commanded her, you know, that stop worrying about us, we're fine. Uh, JJ told her she didn't, I think it was something to the effect of she didn't do anything wrong. And she said, he, you know, he was an adult spirit. He was very tall, uh, Tommy came to her, 
I don't remember if she thanked her because I just can't even bring myself to listen to that bizarre allocution again. <clears throat> but, you know, she was happy. She was, um, you know, taking care of our family, helping our family and, and stuff. So, you know, just bizarreness all the way around. All right, moving on from that. Judge Boyce's review of the matter and pronunciation of the sentence. For me, uh, this was very much a highlight. Um, I know that there has been a lot of criticism of Judge Boyce. Uh, I tried to be like very fair. I'm not a fan girl. Uh, I didn't agree with his decision on cameras in the courtroom. I probably even said I would never agree with his decision on cameras in the courtroom until I was in the courtroom. And, uh, and I even started coming around beforehand, but when I was in the courtroom and I just saw some of the dynamics, I, it did make me wonder how much some of the dynamics in the courtroom contributed to some of Lori's behavior and, you know, how much, you know, some people may have been feeding off each other because she was much calmer and, um, you know, not without criticism, obviously. Judge Boyce addressed uh, some criticism. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, I knew the risks <clears throat> trying to do this live with a cold. Let me get a drink of water. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I, in in true Judge Boyce fashion, he was measured and he was methodical, very much like uh, <clears throat> like Rob Wood was. I would say both of them were. They started off just very well. Well, actually, they kind of took a different. They flip flopped the approach. Um, Rob started with introducing <clears throat> or the you know, focus on the victims. And then, you know, uh, honed in on his appeal regarding the only sentence that would be fair. And, um, and Judge Boyce started with the mitigating factors. So <clears throat> let me um, share something about mitigating and aggravating factors. When I was looking up the whole thing about, like, would she really be eligible for parole in 10 years? I read about how there were... Uh, mitigating factors and aggravating factors, and it and and you know, as an analyst, it, it's like you take an aggregation of the mitigating factors and <clears throat> which kind of pull a, a judge or a jury more toward leniency, and the aggravating factors pull more towards uh, toward severity, and <clears throat> and then you know. Um, and, and that's how a, a jury or a judge makes their decision on, on sentencing. So <clears throat> I knew from having read the statutes that if there was a certain number of aggravating factors, then, at least it was my interpretation, then <clears throat> the death penalty uh, would, you know, could be, and I think even maybe, I'm I'm not sure, but anyway, uh, then the death penalty, the, the uh, defendant was death penalty eligible, so to speak, uh, you know, I'm probably not using the right lingo, but but there was a lot that went into these mitigating and, and aggravating factors. So I knew that if Lori was convicted, there would be an investigation. And the purpose of this investigation was to kind of tally up those mitigating factors and all of the aggravating factors. So I was not at all surprised when Judge Boyce started with the mitigating factors. <clears throat> and I was part of the uh, investigation. So I weighed in. The investigation will never be um, public. It, it will never be, um, it, it falls outside uh, the Freedom of Information Act. And <clears throat> so you know, everyone who was in, you know, who uh, was interviewed was free to share very openly without uh, concern. So they, you know, the, the judge would then take, uh, you know, the, those assessments. I don't know if they're like rolled up. I know he mentioned uh, two different types of scores. <clears throat> Lori also was given 
um, you know, some kind of uh, survey uh, to fill out, which she opted out of. She chose not to um, participate and he made it very clear. The whole purpose of that assessment is to determine if there were more mitigating factors. So he's doing his due diligence. Everyone was doing their due diligence, except for Lori. Well, everyone was doing their due diligence to make sure that all of the mitigating factors were taken into account. You know, and one to protect the case from the appellate court, but also to you know to protect her rights as a citizen of the U.S. So he started with these mitigating factors. He said she was intelligent. Uh, he, he, you know, he cited other people by all accounts. <clears throat> um, certainly not by my account. I actually, and I'm not trying to be offensive. I do not think that Lori was intelligent. I think if she even had a modicum of, of intelligence, there's no way she would have allocated the way that she did. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, but, yeah, you know, uh, he also said that by all all accounts, she was a, a good mother, at least for you know, part of her life, and um, and was an, a model inmate. And he started to kind of transition by saying, you know, like basically, yeah, you know, I, I think he said several times, kind of how surprising it was that as a fifty year old woman, she didn't have a criminal record to date. Of course. I think many of us were sitting there thinking, yeah, because she hasn't been caught. Like, this is the first time she was caught. And as sad as I feel for the residents of Idaho <clears throat> that she brought her clown car to Idaho. And I so love what Rob Wood said in his closing argument about that, you know, <clears throat> she, she didn't represent Idaho and he wanted to send a clear message and he wanted Judge Boyce to send a clear message. Don't come to Idaho and do heinous things like murder kids and, you know, and, and murder others. Um, but <clears throat> as sad as I am for the residents of Idaho, because this is just so incredibly uh, tragic and the entire area you know was was you know experienced trauma from this because it's just like this pleasant you know sleepy little town and um and this evil descended on their town i am grateful that she did roll into idaho because i just don't know that she would have ever faced justice in arizona like <clears throat> you know if anything good comes from the trials and from Maricopa County, I'm just going to count it as a positive, but um, as a bonus, really. But um, I thought it was interesting that he quoted Janice as saying she's not the same person that she knew, and uh, <clears throat> and then he transitioned into the aggravating uh, factors, and he really focused on the heinous nature of the crimes the fact that you know there's the, the there are a few crimes as as heinous as a mother killing her own children um he he talked about watching the jurors <clears throat> uh you know the the disgust on their faces as they saw pictures and video of her uh, vacationing in hawaii while her children were buried in shallow graves like animals uh, on Chad Dadal's um, property. <clears throat> Excuse me. There were so many uh, really fantastic things that he said, like his uh, listening to him really, <clears throat> really kind of like helped me kind of calm down from the earlier you know upset of <clears throat> not that you know it erased it but you know it, i was just so mesmerized uh, by his presentation and just the fairness of it and even when he was saying these glowing things about like you know her perfect uh, <clears throat> uh record uh, uh, being a model inmate and not causing problems and uh, and so I, you know, I thought, well, good, good. And 
you know, that, that's great. And some of the, you know, some of the tea that had been released, it sounds like it wasn't true. Some of the, you know, some of the CD details that were being popped around in the Facebook groups, you know, who knows? You never know what to believe and what not to believe. But uh, according to him, the, the report was that she had been a model <clears throat> inmate. But then he, you know, and he was, he was very, very dispassionate as he went through these, these different details making sure to, you know, hit on everything. <clears throat> Sometimes, you know, reading from his prepared statement, the need, but in the transition, you could tell it was like, he, it just almost felt like someone trying to walk like a Dalmatian that doesn't belong to them, you know, or like from, you know, 101 Dalmatians or something. Yeah, I just kind of pictured it like, you know, he was trying to stay poker face, <clears throat> dispassionate, but uh, but at times it felt like he had to like steady himself. And a couple of times it seemed like his voice even quavered, you know, and, it, and he even talked about how, you know, uh, as a judge, he had decided not to review the details of the case uh, before it went to trial, uh, in as much as you know, he wanted to um, be as objective as possible. Uh, you know, there were some things that he had to rule on, and then those things he would review. But he wanted to try to be as open-minded and objective as possible. But <clears throat> he also said something to the effect of, "Like there are things that he saw that." you know, he'll never be able to get rid of. And so, you know, of course, he's not going to say, like, I personally was traumatized by this case. And I would imagine he can't say that, but reading between the lines, you know, I mean, he, so he, he kind of focused on the jury, but, you know, he was also very impacted by this. And so I appreciated that he gave himself some latitude <clears throat> to be very strong with her. And it wasn't anything theatrical, um, but it was forceful at times. And he did also let her know, like, I, I am lacking mitigating factors because you chose not to cooperate uh, with, you know, in your own defense. And um, uh, one other little detail, there's so much I could share about Judge Boyce, <clears throat> but, um, but I absolutely love that he said that she was shopping for wedding dresses and um, and rings while Tammy was still alive. I shared a post on um, on the community tab for a murderous heart. <clears throat> it wasn't the best format because it um, it it has a uh, a word count limit, so I had to share it like in three different posts. But, and I knew that no one who's casually following this case would ever read through all of that because it also included all of these links and, and stuff. Um, but, um, excuse me, I'm just going to take a drink. But one of the things that bothered me in this is in a vote of no confidence for the prosecution, <clears throat> but uh, the only... Well, the only uh, time the um, the Amazon receipts were put into a timeline was in Kay's testimony. <clears throat> she said that she had found the uh, the Amazon receipt on November eighth. If you listen to uh, the private investigators' interviews before the trial, Rich Robertson, he actually. <clears throat> said that they were monitoring these purchases in real time. And these purchases uh, occurred throughout the month of October. In fact, he even referenced that Chad uh, had returned his ring because it was too small. <clears throat> so there's uh, some misalignment there. But <clears throat> Kay testified that she had um, found the Amazon purchase on November 8th. And when asked when it was delivered, she had said 
<clears throat> just a couple days uh, prior, excuse me. Um, I'm definitely taxing my throat here. Sorry, just one second. Okay, so um, <clears throat> so she had said that it had been delivered a couple days before. Well, a couple days before would have been November 6th. And, and she said it was delivered to Rexburg on November 6th. But on November 6th, Lori wasn't in Rexburg. She was in Hawaii and they had been in Hawaii for a few days. <clears throat> they had been married the day before. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not Tammy's family, excuse me. but I was, you know, really, really hoping that kind of like when Melanie Gibb testified that Lori didn't know that the, or that Lori did know that she was no longer the beneficiary, which I believe was just a parting gift from Melanie Gibb for, <clears throat> to Lori, because I think that she has, uh, I strongly suspect um, that she has a lot of complicity in these crimes, the extent of which we may never know. But I'm hoping we'll find out in the FOIA docs. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I they had someone else testify right after she did that, and it was a ridiculous lie because it was already it, it was an easy to prove lie. So you know, it she was willing to tank her reputation that much more to appease Lori, which tells me she's scared. She doesn't want Lori. Uh, to turn on her. And obviously everyone knows that Lori is petty and vindictive and she doesn't have an internal editor. So I think <clears throat> quite a few people are, are scared of, of angering her. Um, but, um, but they had someone else come on and, and testify. No, she, she did not know. And it was obvious from, you know, she texted uh, Chad, it was a dagger in my heart. We also have a timeline of when the insurance company, um, you know, contacted her and all that. So obviously, I bring another witness <clears throat> to um, uh, to correct that. Um, but in this case, to my knowledge, no one was brought in to let the jury know. <clears throat> no, her wedding ring, and we don't know about any of the rest of these Amazon purchases. All of these details have been passed on to the media, but they weren't passed on to law enforcement. From what I can tell from the FOIA docs that have come from Arizona, they weren't passed on to anyone in Arizona. Um, from what I can tell, and I did read every page and I do really try to be fair. And I always, always say, cause I'm not the only person going through these FOIA docs, feel free to prove me wrong. Like if someone presented a, a screenshot and told me the page that it's on, on the FOIA doc, you know, I absolutely would, you know, print and um, and mention a correction. <clears throat> I put it in the community tab. I put it in Cool Cats, and um, and I'm also going to start posting more on a murderous heart because that particular post, like the community tab, really isn't very helpful in, on YouTube, um, especially if you're on like a TV. You can't click on the links and and things like that. Uh, and it's, it was a longer post. It's going to be split up over three posts. I'm sorry. I know I'm jumping around, <clears throat> but, um, but so I'm going to start putting more things on a murderous heart just so that people aren't like, ah, I can't read these, these longer posts with like more screenshots. So I'll still post them in cool cats, but, um, I'll post them on a murderous heart. But anyway, back to our regularly scheduled program. Um, we know because of the one screenshot that was passed on from all of these Amazon receipts, we know that Lori purchased her wedding ring on October 2nd, and it was delivered to Rexburg on October 7th. That was published on East Idaho News. You can always check out my timeline. I always link to the timeline in the description if you're not familiar, or if you just search any Cushing timeline, it's gonna float to the top. <clears throat> but um, 
But that was delivered on October 7th, which was almost a month before where, where Kay put it, which was November 6th. But my big concern in that is that the jury never knew to my knowledge, and I've asked other people who were, you know, at the trial, uh, attended the trial, followed it more closely, <clears throat> um, that the jury never knew that Lori purchased a wedding ring and most likely, the, you know, her dress and other wedding accoutrement while Tammy was still alive. And so that, that caused me some concern. There were certainly enough other factors uh, <clears throat> that she would, you know, be involved in the conspiracy. I mean, even in just marrying Chad so soon after Tammy's death. But then we found out from juror number eight that they struggled the most over <clears throat> um, the conspiracy charge in Tammy's death. So uh, I don't know how close of a call it was, but a little too close for comfort. Um, and they also struggled with um, Tylee's, <clears throat> the, um, uh, finding her guilty. I'm not sure if it was just of the, the murder um, or if it was murder and conspiracy. Uh, I'm not sure now, but um, <clears throat> a couple of them ha had struggled with that, but they also didn't admit the ratings document. And, and I suspect that both of these things were held back uh, because they they would have opened their witnesses up to <clears throat> a, you know potentially a brutal cross examine uh, a cross examination um, by the defense because from what I can tell from the FOIA docs and I've already talked about this in another live but uh, the rating stock which <clears throat> Chad wrote in October, only four days after meeting Tylee, I mean, after meeting Lori, excuse me. <clears throat> so, so, you know, like put yourself in Lori's shoes, ooh, but if someone tells you four days after you meet this person, oh, by the way, your daughter is a dark spirit. And this person has already had this whole, you know, philosophy and teaching about light and dark spirits, which, you know, he shared with Lori and rated her just a little bit under what he rated Joe, which was, you know, a documentation of Lori's strong feelings toward Joe, obviously. But but Tylee was came in just under Joe and Joe was marked as, you know, sealed away and <clears throat> which we came to find find out that means that you know the you made a contract with Satan and so you're sealed away you're not eligible for any more probations and you're suffering for all eternity in hell <clears throat> like that was that that was what sealed away meant and here's Tylee who's alive and 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 sliding in just under Joe the fact that Lori maintained this affair with this man who raided Tylee, a dark spirit, that speaks conspiracy. Obviously, she did not have an issue with this. And Charles found this document in January, astonishingly, before he was rated and downgraded to be a dark spirit because when he found the document he wasn't a dark spirit he was a light spirit um uh but then you know a week after or within days uh it might have been a little less than a week <clears throat> um but i think he found the the document on the 22nd or 24th something like that anyway and then January 30th or 31st is when all hell broke loose. So he found this document, had Chad Daybell's name before he was rated a dark spirit. He also started forwarding it to family members before he was rated a dark spirit. And he, the only one we have a timestamp on is Colby. That's the only good thing, in my opinion, that came out of that Netflix documentary is, you know, um, some of our cool cats. <clears throat> we're, we're able to, uh, one in particular, I can't remember who it was, but um, if I think of her name, I'll give her credit. Uh, 
<clears throat> but um, but um, we were able to piece together a screenshot and saw this was January 24th. And, um, and what was very apparent is Charles had said, she calls her own daughter a dark spirit, please help her. So he was sending out this document it sounds like on maps, even Colby said he was sending all of this stuff to the whole family. And, and someone told me that like even Rex had this document, Melanie uh, Boudreau, then Boudreau talked about, you know, this, this document. Um, <clears throat> we know that Adam had, ha had this document. Um, but anyway, it just wasn't ever, no one, there's no evidence that anyone ever forwarded it to law enforcement. So law enforcement, when they were blowing off Tylee, and then also these family members were trashing uh, Tylee, and you know, the, the police, the the investigators investigating, you know, um, Charles said they didn't have this information. No one went to law enforcement and said Tylee has been rated a dark spirit and. You know, Charles started being threatening, started being threatened, sorry, by Lori after being rated a dark spirit, you know, so they already knew when Charles started to be threatened uh, that Tylee was also a dark spirit and so was Brandon. And so were, were others, but we know that uh, Tylee and Brandon, they actually acted on, <clears throat> excuse me. So, yeah, so, um, all right, uh, but I am circling back. I, I really love that uh, he shared the detail that she was shopping for wedding dresses and rings while Tammy was still alive. He, I also love that he said, you justified all this by going down a bizarre religious rabbit hole and clearly you are still down there. <clears throat> um, okay, and we all know that you know he delivered five life sentences. I couldn't have ever anticipated five life sentences. I love that he included the little detail of, you know, he's a pragmatic man uh, because, you know, I even thought the same thing, like five, like, we do know that she's not gonna have multiple probations, you know, but um, no, anyway, but you know, that that's compelling, uh, three of which were consecutive, which just means like, imagine, you know, like the the murder and conspiracy to commit murder charges against Tylee, uh, they were concurrent. The murder and conspiracy to commit murder charges against JJ, they were concurrent, con, uh, concurrent, but they were consecutive. So J, Tylee's murder was treated separately from JJ's murder, which was treated separately from Tammy's. Uh, the charge for conspiracy to commit murder. She wasn't charged with first degree murder uh, in the death of Tammy, because she was in Hawaii, and then tacked on another 10 years <clears throat> for the um, grand theft. That was absolutely uh, amazing. Okay, I'm going to break the order to talk ever so briefly about Summer. Again, I, 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 I always want to be fair, even when I have the strong feelings about some of these family members. I try not to let it affect me too much. <clears throat> My perspective on it, we'll never know what caused her to decide that she wanted to keep her um, victim impact statement private only between her and the judge, the prosecutors, uh, and the defense. I believe the defense team also, uh, and maybe, Maybe they don't, but I, I do know that Rob had it because he told me that they would have to turn the <clears throat> physical copy back in and um, and uh, delete the digital copy. It goes without saying, but I'll say that anyway. Of course, he did not share any in even a hint of what she said in her victim impact statement. He would never do something like that. <clears throat> but so we're left to you know kind of. Um, try to piece together, like, why would you decide not to show up and advocate for Tylee when you were designated Tylee's legal representative? And I don't know if it's possible to just say, hey, you know what, 
I don't actually plan on attending the trial before I, uh, be before, you know, I, um, go on the stand. Uh, and, you know, so I'm, uh, if you want to appoint someone else who will act, you know, because I knew that, well, let me back up. I knew that, uh, the, whoever was allowed to, um, to attend the trial, whoever was, um, you know, deemed an immediate family member or a legal representative, it, it seemed logical that by extension, they would then be the ones who would be eligible uh, to give a victim impact statement. And originally I was going to be a witness, but that was when it was a death penalty case. When the death penalty was taken off the table, I was no longer a witness. So, um, so that, well, that wasn't, I wasn't included in that whole thing. Um, <clears throat> but so I personally, again, it's not a fangirl thing. It's just a logic thing. I, I don't hold judge voice responsible for not allowing me to give a victim impact statement. And, um, but I, I do, I, I, mm, I don't know if that is fair to say I hold Summer responsible, um, but I am disappointed that as Tylee's legal representative, she wouldn't show up for Tylee. It was certainly her legal right uh, to keep it private. And that said, when she then decided that she's going to issue a statement through the media, that did very much anger me. The, you know, I on the on the one hand, you know, I I did listen to it. I will give her this. I was grateful that she shared the lovely pictures that she shared and the lovely memories. I, I'm glad that we got a little more insight into Tylee and JJ. Got to see the the really cute pictures. Definitely an upgrade from the picture that she shared right after. Uh, Tylee and JJ's remains were found where it included in her memorial was a picture of Tylee as a young teen. She looks like she's maybe 12, 13, and she is sandwiched between Barry and Janice, and Barry is hunched over and is groping her. Um, and <clears throat> that in absolutely infuriated me. Um, so I was glad, you know, obviously at this point, um, I, she's not, she's not playing games, at least in the pictures. Um, but, you know, I was, as she was sharing her, her statement, you know, I was just trying to, you know, talk myself off the, off the ledge, like, okay, well, at least, you know, Judge Boyce didn't hear any of this, and um, and and someone had told me that Judge Boyce said like that there was, uh, there there was a case where someone had submitted a digital, um, uh, victim impact statement. I think it was like via DVD, so it kind of dates the case a, a little bit. But you know, so I think he was maybe sending out the message um, to you know to some of these other. Uh, people who qualify to give victim impact statements. Hey, you know, you could have someone else read it, or you could even make a digital copy and submit that because of you know this um, case history. But so, um, but uh, I, I do feel like once again, it's a Cox tradition to um, to do what's easy. You know, like talking to the media. I'm not saying it was you know totally easy, but I'm sure. She, I would imagine she put parameters on what Nate could ask her. We don't, we don't know that. Maybe not. Um, but then uh, I was uh, obviously very angry that she would again a solid Cox family tradition to overestimate her influence by echoing. Lori's claim of uh, Joe abusing <clears throat> Tylee and that she would take this opportunity. Here she is talking about, 
you know, how sweet Kylie was and, you know, her, her personality and how sweet JJ was and, you know, this really sweet memories and all of these things. And she finds a way to slip in there. And, oh, by the way, um, let me just do the solid for my sister, in, in my opinion, um, who might be angry that I'm issuing this statement um, that, <clears throat> uh, that Tylee was abused by her dad. So um, quite a few of you have commented, like, you know, maybe it's time. It's, it's someone just this week said, maybe it, it's time to consider addressing this topic. <clears throat> and um, I'm not trying to be manipulative, I, but I, I will say I'm not 100% that I am, like, I would say probably 95% sure I am going to uh, address this topic with some of the information that I have um, from the FOIA docs that were released because um, because of the generosity of the group, always uh, Wicked Truth and F-bombs. Uh, they were the ones who ordered the FOIA docs around Lori and Joe's divorce as well as Lori and Charles' divorce. I haven't even finished reading them, uh, quite honestly, because it was just so unbelievably sad um but uh <clears throat> excuse me but um I, my hesitation has been I, I, at times misinterpreted as like that i believe the allegations um the information that someone who was involved in the uh, investigation passed on to me and these wouldn't be included in foia docs though this person did say i could you know use them as as i wish but um, but there's still a lot of like really incendiary information in there. There are details about people who are now adults. And you know, so I absolutely would never um, just release this document. But um, I am strongly considering, you know, especially since, you know, Lori shared it and then Summer shared it. It's like, okay, Lori, but Lori's batshit crazy, though, you know, um, you know, fit to stand trial. But I mean, you know, her her perception of her influence and her ability to convince people is just so far afield from her actual uh, influence. Um, and, uh, but then for Summer to echo it, uh, I don't think at this point the Cox family really has a lot of credibility. Probably the one with the most credibility would be Rex Connor. Uh, and Megan, um, I know that she's, uh, um, I, I I did listen to her interview with Lauren. It was very insightful. Um, but for the most part, you know, a lot of these family members, they, you know, they're, they're really soft on details. And, and some of the facts they just are dead wrong about or are contradicting themselves from earlier statements with investigators before they knew that this would be like a major case. Okay, <clears throat> so um, enough about Summer. I am also um, at some point going to do a deep dive into Summer. And I hesitate because I, you know, I, I, I won't allow myself as much as I can be self-aware to be retaliatory. It was something that I wanted to talk about anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, once it, it, the, the trial, the parts that I, I followed really, really kind of messed me up. And, um, <clears throat> and so anyway, but I am going to do a live about Summer because I, I'm going to circle back on some of the things that she said, but I feel like it, uh, it warrants its own live, and this is already pretty long. Um, and so, uh, but, you know, I, I, I'll just say by way of introduction uh, that it, it was a little disingenuous of her, to, in my opinion, to say that she wasn't aware of, that Lori had a delusional disorder. But in my opinion, uh, Summer shared those delusions. And so I will take a, a, a deep dive into some of the delusions that according to the FOIA docs she shared and 
and, and some of the information in the FOIA docs were her own text messages to Lori. Once again, when she thought that these were just text messages between her and Lori, and no one would ever know, you know, this was all done under the cloak of night, and now it's just all being ripped back from <clears throat> her. If she had known that one day these text messages uh, would be made public on an international scope, she would have thought twice about some of her claims, some of her boasts, bizarre boasts. Um, and so anyway, so I will eventually do a post about the allegations that Colby made and how Joe was cleared <clears throat> of them. Um, uh, I will try to tiptoe through the tulips as much as I can because I am sincerely empathetic of you know, uh, of Colby <clears throat> and aware that, especially with some of his uh, more recent legal issues, in addition to losing his family, his, his options have, have narrowed. And so I'm not out to make his life more difficult, but unfortunately, I just, I just feel like, you know, I, I need to clear Joe's name. Um, and 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 not and, and just by sharing what is in these documents, I'm not going to add, you know, um, my opinion. I'll I'll share some of my experience. It is going to be a difficult live, just because it will be the ultimate test of you know how I can navigate different landmines and be as merciful to Colby as I can while putting the kibosh on these allegations. Okay. <clears throat> um, all right, so I'm, I'm going to go back in time <clears throat> uh, before, uh, oh no, actually, no, I'm, I'm still in chronological order. Uh, never mind. The, the day after uh, the, the hearing, I met with Rob and Rachel. I had asked Rob before I flew out if I would be able to see the pictures from the autopsies and any any pictures from the crime scenes that were only showed to the jury and family members. You know, they both cautioned me. They both asked, "Are you sure? Are you sure?" And you know, I just told them, you know, it, it's not a morbid curiosity. I know the the risks, <clears throat> but the wondering and you know the um the scenes that run through my mind it it's like just with wondering it's like my thoughts will never have a, a resting place when i just feel like by just knowing my hope was that i would be able to just kind of stop the gerbils from running on their cage so the jury's still out on that no pun intended um but um, so they sat down with me. Now, I thought they were just going to have those photos. And unfortunately, I had uh, I had a, a, a business call like this. This was scheduled at nine. I had a business call at 10 and they came in with three very large binders and gave me full access um, to to these binders and something I was not able to take advantage of. So I just asked them. I will circle back with them after Chad's trial and, and ask to, you know, have a significant time to go through them. <clears throat> but um, but at this point, I, I really just wanted to see the the pictures. And um, <clears throat> so, you know, he and uh, Rob was sitting next to me and he was the one, you know, mostly um, kind of talking me through, walking me through these photos. He was so just empathetic and you know you he didn't owe anything to me you know it was i mean i'm i'm grateful that i was able to see the pictures even though i wasn't at the trial at that time but you know he's just he he was just so soft and when rachel would share you know it was just it was like you know you it was it was similar to that sense i had from lisa it was just like shared humanity like for whatever differences we may have had along the way i respect them so much as prosecutors and um and was just so appreciative like i really went in stealing myself because the last thing i wanted to do 
was to put them in, in this position where, you know, they're already apprehensive. I imagine they probably don't have very um, many families with a uterus asked to look at pictures like this, you know. So, um, so I could tell they were apprehensive. And the last thing I wanted to do was just then put them in a position where like they have to, you know, comfort me or console me or whatever. So I really went in just, you know, stealing myself as much as I could. But so, but they, it was it was just really kind, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, to make a short story very long, it was just, they they were just very kind and, and soft and <clears throat> and um, and we we started with uh, pictures from um, of you know Tylee's remains and we started talking and at that point I had you know con convinced myself like. Yeah. Okay. And so the, the the puncture wounds he he talked about were, you know, they were just hacking away. They didn't know how to dismember a body. So I was a little sheepish in in saying this, but I I think I I still I just wanted to hear it from him, even if he was like, oh my gosh, you know, like, no, oh, you know, I'm sorry if you got that impression, but no, I wasn't saying it was just that. And um, so I was just kind of like, you know, this is gonna sound a little crazy, but I thought you said yesterday that you thought maybe Tylee was stabbed to death and he just looked at me and he said I did or that's what that that is what I was saying and um and it just it was like round two you know of just like oh you know I, oh okay um you know and you know and so I um like just really try i think i did a pretty good job of just you know like keeping my emotions intact as much as possible but you know i definitely noticed it was like they were both just so empathetic you know it was like hmm, um you know just i think it was like they were realizing like uh, that i may not have ever picked up uh, what he had presented in trial and he he did say because i asked him if it would be okay to share this uh if i did a live and he said absolutely because this is all public i shared this um at the at the trial so we had the pictures in in front of us and and it was one of the pictures that you know made him uh i think he had referenced something about like this was a puncture wound so that's when I brought it up and then I knew, okay, all right, so let's let's talk about this. And um, so he was <clears throat> he was showing me these um, puncture wounds in um, Tylee's pelvis. And um, they had uh, at Quantico, I, they had reconstructed uh, Tylee's uh, pelvis with like some of the the vertebrae. I don't know how much you know it it had been shattered, but there there was one collection where he saw her her pelvis and and the vertebrae, and he showed me the <clears throat> the puncture wounds, and um and and pointed out that according to Dr. Christensen, the forensic anthropologist, they were um, sharp trauma, so they were different kind of, let, let's just say for lack of a better word, a chip or, or damage to the bone than where there were signs of dismemberment. They were focused on her left and right hip um, as well as the, uh, <clears throat> the I think the, the back of the pelvis. I think I was looking at the, the back. There were five, areas at this I got from Dr. Christensen's report from that day of the trial. Um, there were five areas of sharp trauma on the left hip bone alone. The point that she had made and, <clears throat> and Rob had made at that time, the reason that, that they came to the conclusion that she was most likely uh, stabbed to death is that in dismemberment, you're going to target the joints and the um, the marks that were consistent with dismemberment, although they were unsophisticated and didn't know how to dismember a body, those marks were uh, in the area of the joints. 
And their point was that you wouldn't dismember uh, a body by <clears throat> stabbing the middle of the pelvis or the, the hips. Those are obviously strong bones. Um, and so, <clears throat> um, so you know, he, he presented a, a compelling enough case uh, as well as, you know, just reviewing Dr. Christensen's report from that day that I, I do have, uh, I, I do personally believe that that was the, that was the cause of death for Tylee. There was an, an issue, um, <clears throat> and I didn't ask him if, if I could, it could show, so I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to, but, um, I, I do understand why he had to be careful in his wording, but I, I do, I did feel like even in the, <clears throat> even at the time, though, you know, I uh, was of two minds. I just thought, how, how could you misconstrue, you know, like consistent with stabbing, you know, at or around the time of death? Um, but, um, but you might think like. And I would, I certainly thought through that, you know, thought through this issue of with all that blood, wouldn't they have found traces of the blood? I mean, we've all, well, I don't know that all of us have watched true crime, but you know, you have luminol, you have UV light, you know, all black light, all, all of these, you know, yeah, there are scientific me means to identify light, <clears throat> but oddly enough, <clears throat> a client I had, um, uh, maybe I don't know, five years ago, they wanted a dashboard, and you, know, you learn about businesses that you never knew existed. Like I had a client once who created custom urns for pets, and you know, and I helped build them a dashboard, a marketing dashboard for um, his business. And so you see the keywords they're you know bidding on on like Google and stuff. And so this client i just wouldn't have ever thought that this was a business but <clears throat> their entire business was cleaning up after murders and suicides so i knew from working with this client because um, you know unfortunately for hotels a lot of people commit suicide in hotels so <clears throat> but also you know in their homes and family members you know want to that they obviously don't want to you know clean up that um that you know um they, they don't want to clean up after their loved ones hotels don't want someone coming in with a black light <laughs> i didn't know that people did things like that but anyway so they when they want it cleaned up um right and so i knew from working with this client and that they had their own proprietary solvent that <clears throat> removed all uh, all blood. And I, I was really torn on whether or not to share this, but it doesn't take a sophisticated uh, solvent or certainly not bringing someone in. She wouldn't hire someone to uh, clean up the blood if indeed Tylee was stabbed to death. <clears throat> but, um, there, you know, anything with active oxygen, like OxyClean, makes blood not traceable, and um, and and so, like even um, since the hearing, I did a search, and I'll share the article because it's from two thousand nine. I'll share it in the description because two thousand nine, you know, there's a very good chance that Lori would have searched how to uh, clean up. Blood, but also um, from what we know, uh, Roxbury Police only sent a forensics team into Alex's apartment. So they <clears throat> they searched all three apartments, but according to what Ian had said, they didn't want to you know kick in the door to Alex's apartment. So they asked Ian. Uh, for the code to get into his garage, which that's a whole other issue. <laughs> like, how is it that Ian, who, you know, at that point, this was December 19th. <clears throat> so Alex had been dead a week as the day before the case went public. Ian supposedly you know, hadn't told Melanie yet that he um, had worn a wire and had 
cooperated with police in the in investigation and the FBI, uh, but somehow he knew the, you know, um, the code to get into Alex's garage. That's weird. But anyway, but he gave, as his story goes, he gave uh, police the the code, and they took a forensics team into Alex's apartment. Now, we haven't received the FOIA docs from Idaho, and we won't until after uh, Chad's trial, <clears throat> but there hasn't, there, there hasn't been a reference to them sending in a forensics team into uh, Lori's apartment. So I don't know what was, what was done with that, but um, I, like I said, I, I strongly suspect that, um, that Ty Lee was stabbed to death. And um, with that, I'm going to wrap up i'm sorry to end on such a a low note <clears throat> um but uh but i will open it up for questions just because we haven't had a live in in so long i probably don't have a lot of voice left um but uh if you have a question if you asked a question early on it doesn't matter if you put question in all caps I'm not going to see it. I'm not going to do Q and A that long. But if you have a question, please write question in all caps. Don't write it out your whole question in all caps because that actually it makes it harder to read. Um, but just write the word question in all caps, and that will help me uh, see your question. And for the rest of you who don't care about the Q and A, thank you for hanging in uh, this this late. Um, I I am. <clears throat> known for marathon lives. Okay. Um, okay. And it might be that no one has asked questions because uh, I wasn't even sure if I would do a Q&A. Um, so I'll just scan for a little bit. And if there aren't questions, then we'll, we'll call it a night. But <clears throat> oh, <laughs> um, uh, oh, <laughs> these are sweet. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, it's kind of hard to to read them. I think I almost have to take a screenshot on them because I'll read a question and you know I always uh, preview them first um, because I I learned that the hard way. But then <clears throat> before I can read them, they they pop up. So um, so I'm going to take a couple of screenshots just so I don't sound like Rain Man trying to read them. <clears throat> um. No, Forever Wonder uh, asked if there's, uh, is there anything we can do for you or that you'd like us to do? Yes, um, I haven't shared the link to the petition for Phoenix Police to open uh, Joe's, <clears throat> uh, open the, the, an investigation, a real investigation. They never investigated his death, uh, but to open a, an actual investigation into his death, I have a petition. If one of my mods could share it in the chat, that would be fantastic. If you haven't shared it already, um, if, I'm sorry, if you haven't signed it already, I would be forever uh, grateful <clears throat> if you are so inclined. Um, uh, FJ asked, how are you holding up? Thank you for everything as always. Um, I, yeah, so it, uh, it was a, a rough few days. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm not totally on the other side, but then my daughter and I went out last night and we, it was just like this unbelievable series of events where, which is like, I was on the subway <clears throat> and this little um, Yorkie was just like, you know, like licking me and kissing on me. And I'm just like, you know, petting it. And um, my daughter has a Yorkie, we call him a New Yorkie. And, you know, it was, you know, it, it just like, I wanted to have a good time last night. It was kind of a special occasion. And and um, and so we were on our way to dinner and I also didn't want to bring my daughter down. <clears throat> but um, so it was just like, 
you know, it's almost like the universe was like, who could we use? Oh, a dog, <laughs> a dog, yeah. And so, um, so then, you know, we go to the restaurant, it's a really nice dinner, homemade pasta, you know, everything was, was wonderful. Then we decide to go to this like kind of bougie ice cream place here in the city. I've never seen it anywhere else, but anyway, um, so we went there and, um, and not one, but two different dogs. So we're just like sitting eating, eating our ice cream and two different dogs came up to me while I was eating my ice cream because people come in, they order their ice cream to go, they bring their, <clears throat> their dog with them and this particular ice cream place gives them like puppuccinos and stuff. So, um, two different people brought in their dogs and i'm I, I kid you not like they both just like jumped on top of me one was licking my face i actually don't really like like dog tongues so like my <clears throat> my daughter's dog finnegan he licks me twice and pulls away <laughs> you know, so he's like he knows that's about my tolerance but um <clears throat> but i i absolutely adore dogs but i just don't like all the slobber uh but but they were like, you know, jumping up and I'm like rubbing them under the chin and licking me on the face. It wasn't even bothering me because I was just like, okay, you know, like when the third dog of the night, um, you know, did this, I was just like, it just, my daughter and I just were just laughing because it was like, this is, this is getting like borderline ridiculous, you know? So then we're walking back to the subway. We're like, you know, our spirits are kind of high at this point and, um, <clears throat> you know, emotionally, I, I, I didn't, like, I don't, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not saying I'm high. I don't, I don't do that. But anyway, so, um, <clears throat> um, so we're walking to the subway and my daughter sees this host. I didn't notice him, but she turned and he was just this really fabulous guy with this fabulous shirt and this fabulous tie. And they did not go together, but he made them go together. So my daughter turned and was like, I love your shirt. And then he's like, thank you. You know, and, um, and then, uh, and then she's like, oh my gosh, your glasses. And I said it almost at the same time because they were lime green. He had these fabulous lime green glasses. And I'm walking around in a lime green shirt. Of course, my lime green is my favorite color. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, and so we're just having a good time. And then he is like, hi. Hey. And, and, and sorry if you know anyone is anti-alcohol, if this uh, offends, um, I... I'm not a big drinker at all. Like usually it's just at conferences. I just don't, it just doesn't do much for me. But <clears throat> he said, let me treat you to uh, samples of our, um, they called them boozy slushies. And, um, and so it, Destiny was like, oh, that's perfect because it's my mom's birthday anyway so i didn't mean to tell that part anyway so she's like it's my mom's birthday and so he's like oh that's great well then the you know the level of the like celebratory gust whatever it was you know just went up a few levels so then this other guy walks out <clears throat> He sees all of this happening and he whoops he just joins in and <clears throat> and like compliments my shirt and then asks if uh if destiny was my older sister and i'm like who you are smooth you know and um anyway we're just all having a, a really great time and um and then he says to the host he's obviously a regular and he was like um put two glasses of champagne on my tab for the ladies and so Destiny chimes in and she's like, this is perfect because it's my mom's birthday. This all happened last night. Anyway, and so then you, you know, it just, it just built and built. And so we ended the night on this unbelievable high note. And, <clears throat> and, you know, the whole day I was just kind of like, you know, just still so heavy with everything that had happened and everything that, you know, I had learned and, and stuff and, um, and just trying to process everything, but it ended on such a high note. And so this morning when I, when I woke up, I just woke up, like just, you know, feeling lighter, feeling happier. It was like, I was still, you know, just kind of, <clears throat> um, 
uh, you know, yeah, carried along by what had happened the night before. So that's how that's how I'm doing. Um, anyway, uh, um, so Cheryl, Sherilyn asks, do you think Lori's family will quit using the word delusional and accept that she's just evil? I don't, I don't think so. I, yeah, I, I just don't. Thank you for the birthday greetings, everyone. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I, I, I think for them to acknowledge, it, from what I've heard, and like I said, I haven't, I haven't watched any of um, Rex and Adam's podcasts yet. I. I need to get on the other end of school and, <clears throat> and yeah, I just have other priorities, but, um, but from what I've heard, uh, I, my, I think probably Rex and Megan would probably be the closest. I just, I just don't know about the rest of them because I think they have enough distance from it that they don't have to accept if she's evil, that means that we uh, we enabled a lot of evil. Like if it was evil to clean out Charles' house of his possessions and not leave them for his sons, if it was evil to you know text my sister the day before Charles was murdered, if that's the case. I'll, I'll kill him myself with multiple exclamation marks, something to that effect, to where Lori has to say, no, 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 I need you safe. You know, but, well then, you know, I, I just think it, if they accept that Lori is evil, and then any of the ways that they enabled her, that they were complicit, that they aided her, <clears throat> that they helped her, justify her actions like Kobe said that when they were clearing out the house that you know Lori told him that she was going to get remarried right away and um, you know I mean uh, all of these different things like why wouldn't you go to the police with that obviously because you know she was your mother and you're cleaning out her, you know um Charles home and you know all all of these things and and she definitely uh manipulated and and took advantage of his poverty not that that justifies him accepting <clears throat> what was almost down to the dollar all of Tylee's social security uh and benefits between september and october but i just think across the board <clears throat> if if Lori's evil then i think they would have to grapple with and it, Am, am I evil for having been complicit, for having <clears throat> divided loyalties, for not doing everything in my power uh, to protect these victims? And I just don't know that they will be able to do that. My personal opinion in trying to be as fair as possible, anyone who could have helped these victims and withheld evidence or you know, didn't go to police and didn't advocate for Tylee when they all knew she was in imminent harm. And now Lori was just taking off with her, alienating her, alienating JJ. He sold his, uh, or tried to sell, you know, Bailey and then gave him away. Why, why wouldn't JJ need Bailey just because they're moving to Idaho? You know, anyone who let Tylee as a 16 year old drive by herself to Rexburg. Like we, we, we know from uh, one of her friends uh, interviews with law enforcement that Tylee had called her while she was on her way to Rexburg because she didn't want to drive alone, she just wanted company. And, you know, it's like, it, again, it's so easy to hear all these bizarre details of these uh, of, of these murders and zombies and, you know, mutilation and, you know, dismemberment and burning Tylee's remains and wrapping JJ in, you know, the, these bags and, 
you know, and 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 seeing that, and it's just like it's 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 so much more horrific than I ever could have imagined, you know, and um, but you know, and like anyone who could have even just said, you know what? Oh, oh I'm sorry. This so why I lost my train of thought. I'm gonna blame it on cold meds and chemo. But um, although I did this long before I was uh, treated for cancer, but uh, anyone who you know, be okay, sorry, because of the horrific nature of these crimes, it's easy to lose sight of some of these details that show Lori's cruelty. Like the fact that, like, if anyone has had a young driver in their home, the fact that at sixteen. She would be left to drive by herself, according to what she told the detective who was interviewing her, from Texas to Arizona. And you know she was following Lori. Lori wanted her dead. So Lori was probably driving like a bat out of hell, hoping that, you know, Tylee would die in an accident. Like that would that would be the convenient way. And we know that she wanted Charles to die in a car accident. She thought that she and Zulema had the power to um to author that to contrive that so i imagine she was probably driving well beyond a 16 year old inexperienced driver's uh, ability to navigate interstates and then again from arizona to idaho and they have this big family and everyone's like oh i just adored tylee and you know, tie tie this and oh, you know, like I would have taken them in if I had known. Again, easy to say in a recorded call, but they all saw that Tylee was abandoned by Lori and staying at Alex's, the creepy Uncle Alex, who, you know, was like back and forth between Columbia and, you know, all, all of these things. And they're like, yeah, yeah, that's a that's a an acceptable place for a 16 year old whose mother abandoned her. And I've mentioned this in other lives, like even when Summer and and Janice were interviewed, like they, they never said she was taking care of her kids. Janice said, you know, we, but something to the effect of like, you know, we had no reason to expect, you know, or, or, or suspect that, you know, she could do this. Um, she was caring for JJ. And I'm just like, you know, she had another child and that child was 16 when when she was abandoned by her mom. So, you know, so it's easy to say after she was discovered, murdered, dismembered, burned, like I would have taken them. Like You had the opportunity. You had the opportunity, especially, um, you know, a family with, with JJ, which I'm not going to touch on that. That's, you know, too whatever but also but definitely lori's family with tylee but they just let her stay at alex's knowing that he was a long distance driver and 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 we already know from some of their text messages that he was already convinced at that point when tylee was living with him that she was a dark spirit and of course you know he would have gotten the ratings and he was all in we i, I have definitely become convinced that Lori was able to manipulate him because of his low IQ. Megan talks about him having had a, a car accident. And uh, she, I think she said they didn't, they didn't believe in health insurance. So uh, Alex literally just walked away from the, the accident and they believe he had a traumatic brain injury and it wasn't treated. So, you know, who knows but but you know but you can tell from the things that alex did and some of the the things that he wrote and then also uh some of the the details that we've heard from different family members he was a very very low iq and um and easy to manipulate but anyway and so you know, so now the family, like, you know, Adam and different people are saying, like, oh, you know, he was under her spell. He just believed whatever she believed. Well, then that's all the more reason, if you believe that, to 
like rescue Tylee. Like Tylee is with this person who different people are now saying, oh no, he, you know, he was in lockstep with Lori the entire time. So anyway, so yeah, I, I just, I just don't, I, I, I think that, you know, um, I, I see evidence of Lori's religious fervor just in different expressions in some of these family members. But, but there's, you know, there's that consistent, <clears throat> um, I don't know, uh, rub between what they preach and what they do. And, now, and you know, I'm not, I'm not saying like a- anyone who believes in, in God or, you know, has, has a religious faith, but that doesn't mean that they're going to be perfect. And, you know, I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying like, you're stepping into the spotlight as someone who is equipped to instruct others in how they should live. And, but then there's, you know, it's like just more and more details can, you know, would come out of complicity, complicity, complicity. I'm not saying the legal definition, I don't know, what the parameters are on that are, but I'll, I'll say uh, complicity through acts of omission um, and or commission. <clears throat> you know, it's it's all throughout. Um, okay, I'll answer a couple more questions. That was a long one. Um, oh, HRH. Jesus Christ, she has two, um, she's one of my favorite people. Hey, uh, she has two 16 year old twins. Yeah, yeah, so imagine just, just I'm not, yeah, no, no, uh, no, yeah, it's just, I can't even imagine. Um, uh, okay, All right. Okay, I don't see. Oh, okay. This is a good question. HRH, please. Um, that that's her. That's her uh, profile. Um, how did you discover Colby had received all of Tylee's uh, social security? So I was at this part of the trial, and when. Colby was being questioned. I think there was only like a total of a hundred dollars accounted for. I think it was, if memory serves me, I think it was uh, sixty dollars and forty dollars. But then, uh, for in, I believe it was the forensic accountant got up. Um, let me check my notes. I'm probably not going to be able to check until it doesn't matter. So someone got up and um, and. It gave an accounting of the total amount that Colby had received um, specifically from Tylee's account. Um, and so what I did, um, and if someone reminds me, we, yeah, if someone reminds me, like one of my mods, don't remind me in a comment because I may or may not see it. Um, well, comment, yes, not in the chat. Uh, but um, I, I'll well, I'll share a post uh, with uh, like the the numbers because that that would be good to do. Uh, <clears throat> but this forensic accountant shared the total amount that Colby had received from Tylee's account between September and December, and we already knew because I've kept a record of. Uh, all of the the transfers from Tylee or Lori. Some of them I knew were from um, Tylee and some I I knew were from Lori because Lori and I were friends on Venmo. Um, Excuse me. And that's only because that's how Venmo is set up. If the person is a contact on your phone, you set up Venmo. Anyone who's a contact is going to be a friend unless you unfriend them. So I you know, I never looked at Lori's Venmo, didn't know we were friends until I went uh, into her, her Venmo. And I had taken a rolling screenshot before some of these transactions started going missing. So uh, this was after Lori was arrested. 
And so it was apparent that uh, uh, Colby, most likely, because the only two people who can set a transaction to hidden are the person who received it. And uh, Lori was in prison. Her phone was with law enforcement and the person, you know, so the person who sent it and the person who received it and the person who received it was Colby. Um, so unless someone else, or I, I guess I should say someone in control of Colby's phone, that's what a detective would say. Um, <clears throat> but so these transactions started disappearing, but I had this rolling screenshot from before. So I knew the, the, the dates that Tylee, that some of the dates that Tylee had um, sent him transfers. And I knew that she had sent him a transfer on, so, uh, so um, maybe I didn't know that she had transferred him on money on September 8th. I knew that there was a transfer on September 8th and September 10th. So they straddled Tylee's murder. But <clears throat> one, we found out at the trial that uh, Colby had reached out to Tylee and asked her for money, and Tylee told him she's not in control of her money, which should have been a major red flag. But we know, I mean, at that point, and that that was really hard to process because at that point, and again, I'm trying to, I'm not trying to be unfair to Colby, but it was like, we know she had hours to live, and um, and. So it appears that he then reached out to his mom because there was a transfer from one of them on September 8th. <clears throat> but um, but the total of those transfers uh, ended up being within a few dollars. Of what I what I did was I took the Social Security benefit amount um, that Tylee received from Joe, and you know just did some simple math and it was almost exactly uh, what Colby had received. Um, and so, you know, so that, that just begs uh, the question, like, like, you know, what did you think Colby, I mean, what did you think Tylee was living off of? We know that she had a $400 car payment <clears throat> and um, and we we know that she was paying for her phone, but then you know also you know he was supposedly believing she was a college student. You know what did you think she was was living off of? So anyway, um, but that's that's how uh, that's how I uh, came to that conclusion. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Philly. That's sweet. Uh, Flashback asks, uh, could you comment on Lauren Mathias's videos tracing Alex's phone on the way back from Yellowstone? Uh, to be perfectly honest, I, I haven't seen it, so I can't comment on it. Uh, Peace Fingers asked, has Kay acknowledged Charles' recent accusation? Um, not to my knowledge. Um, thank you. Coffin. <laughs> I don't even know where that is. I, I don't know how to um, pronounce that. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay. So, Mandolin Wind asked. Um, I'm backtracking. When uh, when you went to see Tylee back in that spring, was Lori upset with you? I asked because I think. He throws digs your way, the trial about Joe. Uh, yeah, so I I shared uh, a live uh, about this. I think it was the live about my experience with Lori as a translated being or something like that. Um, I went into quite a bit of, of detail. That, that visit, but just a quick overview, that visit was um, mix like there were times where you know, things were I, I you know I, I really always try to be fair like things were pleasant like we went out um one time to like a, a gaming place you know kind of like a Dave and Buster's um 
And, you know, that was, that was fun. In fact, that was the, the only reason I have a picture. I have two pictures of Tylee from that trip. <clears throat> At that point, I had a really bad pixie and I hate having my picture taken. Like my kids forced me to get in front of a camera. Um, and so, and, and I'm really not photogenic. Um, but, uh, but so I don't like having my picture taken, but neither did Tylee. And I think she was self-conscious. And so I, re I respected that. Unfortunately, that's the reason we don't have a picture. Um, <clears throat> but he was playing, um, I think it was air hockey. Yeah, she was playing air hockey with her mom. And I snuck a couple of pictures. Uh, one of the two of them and then just one of Tylee. And that's how I was able to just prove this whole like fake picture that was put out there as proof that Tylee was at uh, Kobe's wedding. I talked about that in another live. She was not at Kobe's wedding. Lori told me that herself. Um, uh, but the picture that had been uh, tossed out there, it, was Tidy was so much younger than the picture I had taken. She was also um, uh, <clears throat> thinner. Her face was was thinner. Uh, she had fresh highlights, and when I saw her, um, like her highlights were like kind of halfway down her uh, braids. Like she had braids when we went out, but her highlights were were growing out. And she just looked, you know, considerably older. But anyway, um, I actually thought I was slick in taking those pictures. And the last time I, I tossed them out, because again, it like came back up that no, Tylee was at, you know, uh, Colby's wedding, even though Kelsey herself said that she wasn't at the wedding. Um, but okay, but some Facebook group, you know, um, a leader, has the inside scoop but and zach also said in a private facebook group that she wasn't at the wedding that um she was i was told she was at work he had said in that group that she was at a girls camp i'm like it's january how many girls camps are there in january maybe maybe in arizona but and then someone else like met in the middle eventually saying, I think she worked at a girl's camp, but either way, it's just like, you know, that's, that's troubling that Tylee wasn't at the wedding. But anyway, so I thought I was slick and that Tylee didn't know I had taken the pictures. The last time I, I pulled them up, I realized in one of the pictures, she was looking right at me and kind of like smirking. I, I just I had never realized that before. But anyway, so she caught me taking a picture of her. But um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, so there, there, there definitely were good times. We went out to eat and, you know, we, we played with JJ and... I, I've already shared that, you know, Lori was very appropriate toward Jay-Z. This I have to give her. Like, she was very protective of him. He was a runner. He, um, like, I remember her telling me <clears throat> I had to go out to the car uh, to get something. Or uh, I think I was going for a run. She was like, okay, you can take the key. But make sure when you come back, I had to put it on this shelf that was high up. So that even if JJ dragged over a chair, he wouldn't be able to, to reach the key. <clears throat> Nobody left the front door unlocked because he would run. That's why, you know, again, this is a small detail. When I saw uh, that video of him playing in just the front yard, I was just like, what? I think she was hoping that he would run away because... I, you know, I, they told me like Lori and Charles told me about instances where, you know, he would um, get out of the house and just run and they would have to go and look, look for him, find him in the neighborhood, you know? So anyway, um, so good times. She was, you know, very appropriate uh, with JJ. <clears throat> uh, the only criticism was, uh, you know, like with JJ, 
Lou was, we went out to eat once and JJ was like climbing all over the, the car. He wasn't in, in a, a seatbelt or car seat. And Lori just said, you know, they couldn't keep him in uh, a seatbelt. So, you know, I have never had an autistic child, so I certainly wasn't going to judge, but I did worry. Um, <clears throat> but other than that, and like feeding him junk, you know, um, but uh, yeah, very, very appropriate with JJ from everything that I can remember. With Tylee, the, you know, I've talked about, there was definitely tension. And then eventually there was tension between Lori and me. There was tension with the incident with her pulling out the photo albums. <clears throat> uh, I've, I've talked about this, so I won't go too far into detail, but uh, there was a box of photo albums, that were my family's photo albums. They were the only photos we we had, and there was already an issue with Joe insisting on taking all of them. There was a big fight between him and another brother. They never spoke again. They died within months of each other. <clears throat> but so she had these photo albums, and she asked me. Uh, to she pulled them out of the garage, and when she opened up the box, even before she opened up the box, I mean, it just leaked of uh, decomposing flesh. Like I've never smelled what a, do a dead body is, smells like, but I was confronted with it, and that was after you know weeks of excuse me sitting in the garage, but. You know, it was also sitting in a hot garage. Um, but <clears throat> so she had asked me to go through this photo album and write down these different family members' names. But so I actually have text messages where I was texting uh, two of my brothers. My sister is, is no longer alive. She was the first to die. But I was texting my one brother who's now deceased and my only living brother. Just to ask them, like, who is this person? Who is this person? Who is this? You know, because I was the baby of the family. I was two months old when I went in to an orphanage and then to foster care. I don't know who a lot of these people are. And I only saw my dad once a year. So they would be texting me back. Oh, that's <clears throat> that's Uncle Mickey when he was younger. Or that's, you know, uh, Aunt So-and-so or, you know, whatever. And um, or I don't know. So I'm writing these names in, and I came across uh, uh, a picture. This was only like probably a handful of pages in, because you know I this is this I I was like obviously it was just so gross. It was I was retching, and um, and I was trying to keep the peace because there had already been a different incident with Lori. So I'm trying to do this thing that she was like, I want Tylee to have this. I want Tylee to have this. I think in retrospect, she was probably just going to like, I don't know, do that substitutionary baptism or, you know, whatever, um, <clears throat> whatever that's called. I don't mean disrespect. I just don't remember all the terms. Um, but, uh, but I came across a picture of the five of us and those are pretty, they're, they're rare. Like there are very few of them. And, um, and so I asked her if I could have that picture and she was like no i that i want uh tylee to have that picture all the more and and i was just thinking like there is no way tylee care is ever like, maybe like one day years and years down the road she might get sentimental and be like you know like <clears throat> runner dna or you know like be curious about family but there's no way that she cares about these people who I don't even know who they are. She barely knew who I was, you know? And so the fact that she wouldn't give me that picture, this really made me angry. And so I just said, I'm done. And I put down <clears throat> the pen and, you know, I, I don't remember what she said. It was like something, you know, in her kind of enthusiastic trying to be really persuasive like oh no you know like this is really important blah 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 and i just said i'm sorry i can't i can't i can't do this you know and um anyway so um and then i i, I think i was at the airport and it occurred to me oh my gosh wait i should ask her to 
I, I remember that um, <clears throat> Charles, when she had sh shown me his office, I, I was pretty sure he had a scanner. I wasn't exactly sure, but it was pretty, I mean, most, most printers come with a scanning ability. So I was just like, ah, why didn't I ask her to scan that picture? So I, I texted her and I was like, hey, you know what, could you scan that picture of us and, um, and, and just, you know, email or text it to me? And she was like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have it anymore. And so, you know, again, so anyway, so there, there were other incidents with her. Um, there was one where we were working out with Colby. God forbid I was stronger than she was and that, and Colby was like kind of poking the bear and teasing her, you know, like as he like lowered the weight. I wasn't that much stronger. I was just a little stronger, but this was way more important to Lori than it, than it was to me. And I'm not trying to flex. I just didn't care, you know, and I just wanted to keep the peace. So I just kept like saying kind of self-effacing things like, yeah, well, I would give up these, you know, extra 25 pounds that you know, that I can curl or what, not, not curl, um, <clears throat> you know, deadlift or whatever, uh, in exchange for your figure, you know, so it was just like, you know, just trying to keep her calm, because I could tell she was, she was really getting angry. And so she did something that was very retaliatory, in my opinion, it was just toxic and mean. And, um, and so, you know, at, at that point, I was just, I just couldn't wait to get out of there. And then the last night I was there, she, Tylee and I were supposed to have a girls night out and um, Tylee and I were ready. And she just came in and was like, well, I'm going to bed. And that was it. She just walked, walked into her bed. And um, anyway, and so, you know, that was, that was shocking. It was disappointing. Um, the whole purpose for her asking me to come out was so that I could be like a support to Tylee, but she never gave us a moment alone until uh, until uh, that night, which was meant to be retaliatory, in my opinion. You know, because otherwise you would at least say like, I am so sorry, I have a headache. I was really looking forward to our girls' night out, you know, but, um, you know, I'm, I need to go to bed. It was, no, it was just, okay, I'm gonna go to bed, good night. And, and, um, but it was a blessing in disguise because that was the one night that Tylee and I had time alone. And um, anyway, so I don't, don't wanna go into the details. I've already uh, shared about, um, you know, it, it was truly, I'm not just saying this because Tylee is dead. It was a very, very sweet, conversation. I even have a text message. I might throw that out there if someone reminds me. It was a text. I won't throw it out on YouTube because YouTube has this ridiculous requirement where like it it everything has to be a perfect square. Anything outside a perfect square will get cut off, which is just so stupid. It's 2023. But so anytime I like share a screenshot, if it's long, I have to add white space to the sides and vice versa. But this is a very, very long uh, text exchange that I had with one of my kids. And it was in there that I, um, I said, I, I think Lolo may be a sociopath, but I also reference this conversation. I had with Tylee and and her response. So if someone reminds me, I will throw that out in uh, Cool Cats and um, and A Murderous Heart on Facebook. I'm not trying to get people to you know follow A Murderous Heart on Facebook. The last thing I really needed was one more thing to you know um, manage. Uh, and so as soon as when these cases are over, I'm walking away from all of it, and I'm going to go back to talking about making data sexy, but. Um, <clears throat> so follow me, don't follow me. Subscribe, don't subscribe. I really don't care. But um, uh, but I, I will throw that out there again if one of my um, uh, mods reminds me because it's like the only kind of proof I have. And it was just such a such a great reminder. Like when the kids went missing, you know, of course I, I texted Lori it came back green. I was like, oh my gosh, she's in the wind. And, you know, honest, honest God, I, I, 
when that text came back green, I was just like, the kids are dead. Um, she was an iPhone user, always, uh, always an iPhone user, you know, for the text to go through uh, green. I, I already had my suspicions. This was very weird. I had seen her, you know, in the beginning of her descent into madness or probably more likely in, in the middle, not even, no, I won't even say more likely. She was in the middle of her descent into madness. I, I think I think she has been at minimum a malignant narcissist and the entire time I knew her. But anyway, um, okay, with that, uh, we are we we are coming in just under three hours. So I'm going to call it a night. Um, you know, though the content <clears throat> wasn't a pleasure to delve into. It's always a pleasure to get to interact with the community. I do go through the, the chat afterwards and, and review it. And so <clears throat> to those of you who stayed three hours, I mean, you know, my hat's off to you, although I'm not going to actually take my hat off to you. Anyway, um, have a wonderful night and weekend. Good night.